And there we go. Okay, so um, I'm going to ask that you mute yourselves unless you are turning it on to um, ask a question. And um, I have the the chat box open as well. So if you will have questions that you want to type into the chat, I will keep an eye on it and I will address those questions as we go. So we're basically going to go through this entire review packet. Uh, we'll take a break at about the two hour mark because four hours is a really long time to sit on a Zoom uh, meeting. So uh, we will have a break at, at one point to kind of refresh ourselves. Uh, my name is Dr. X, by the way. So, um, and I will include my email in the chat as well. So if you need to reach out or ask a question um, after the fact, feel free to do so. So, all right, let's start with um, going over exercise seven, all about enzymes. Exercise seven was about um, amylase activity, right? And just kind of like learning what enzymes are and how they accomplish their functions. So what are enzymes and what are they made of? How would we answer this first question? You can either answer in the chat or you can turn on your microphone. It's the amino acid. Right, yeah, so enzymes are proteins. So they are going to be made of amino acids. Reaction. I'm sorry. Um, enzymes catalyze chemical reactions. Right. So they um, they catalyze chemical reactions. We can put that down here for the next question, uh, and that's why they're important because they help these chemical reactions occur that normally would take a lot longer or take a lot more energy. Um, So a lot of these chemical reactions are required for just general life processes. And so living systems can be a lot more complex and a lot more energy efficient because of enzymes. Um, add that as well. Um, so if we had a scenario where a person had a very high fever for a long time, uh, what do you think that would do for cellular function? And think of in the context of enzymes and their activities, how would a high fever affect chemical reactions? It would denature the enzyme. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. So a high fever, especially if it's prolonged, um, would really threaten the shape of the enzymes, it would cause them to denature. And then what would this do to general like cellular functioning? It will have an effect, it will have a terrible effect in the cellular function. Right, yeah, so the enzymes would denature and if they're not around to catalyze these chemical reactions then the cells function is going to suffer. Oh yeah, without, without enzymes, um, many chemical reactions would just stop and that would be very bad. So one of the really key features of enzymes is its specificity. So how do we determine the specificity or what determines the specificity of an enzyme? Uh, we can determine it by the active site of the structure and the structure of the enzyme. Sorry, by the active site and the structure of the enzyme. Right. Excellent. Yeah. So specificity is determined by that active site, by the, the shape or the structure of the active site, which is going to allow only a very specific substrate to bind and react. Wait, shape and structure of the active site. Uh, only one substrate. 
we bind. All right, if you have just joined us um, and you haven't seen anything in the chat, uh, that means you have not yet filled out the attendance form. So make sure you uh, click on this link and record your attendance so you get credit for being here. So when we think about enzymes increasing uh, rate of chemical reactions, what exactly are they affecting? So this is a little um, drop down menu. Oh, and these are all very, very small. So the first option is lowering activation energy. Second option is increasing activation energy. Are they providing activation energy, providing ATP or generating heat to speed up molecular movement? German, I see you have your hand raised. First up is not German, it's Herman. Herman, okay, sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, and second off is, the, is that you should decrease the activation of energy. Or you could- uh, Exactly, yeah. So enzymes are, the way that they work is they lower the activation energy. So they lower that activation threshold uh, that is required to sort of kick off this reaction and allow it to happen. Okay, so now we're talking about temperature um, in the other direction. So not in a fever state, but if you had an enzyme at zero degrees Celsius for a long period of time, uh, and then you brought it back up to its normal operating temperature, uh, what would you expect its activity to be like? Would it still be active and why? Yes, it will still be active. I mean, even if you keep it at zero degrees, it will be still active. I mean, you would, ex I mean, yeah, because of, it will be active because of the structure of the enzyme remains the same. Okay, so the structure um, is not affected by that cold temperature. So what does the cold temperature do then? If it doesn't affect the structure, um, what does it do to an enzyme? It's inactive because of the um, lack of kinetic energy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So at cold temperatures, um, enzymes are inactive, but they still retain their shape. So they're not denatured like they would be at a high temperature. They're just kind of dormant. They're sort of waiting for, uh, you're right, that kinetic energy to kind of re reactivate themselves. Can you say what you mean by the kinetic energy? You need kinetic energy to reactivate themselves? Yeah, so kinetic energy, that's one of the types of kind of energy in our universe. And typically by kinetic energy, we're talking about heat. We're talking about like thermal energy, this like energy of atoms or molecules moving. So if we have a very cold temperature, these molecules, they are just kind of like, just, you know, hibernating almost. They're just in one state and there's just not enough like molecular movement for these chemical reactions to happen and for them to interact with their substrates and make and break bonds. So kinetic energy, think energy of movement and think heat. And those two, those two things allow these molecules to sort of kind of like interact with each other and, and crash into each other. Got it, thank you. All right, um, so if we wanted to list the factors that denature a protein, a protein or an enzyme, what would they be? It would be um, temperature, pH, and salt concentration. Right, yeah, so temperature, so very, very high temperatures um, kind of melt those bonds that hold the three-dimensional structure, and then Next one would be pH, which the same thing, it affects those um, bonds holding it in the tertiary and secondary shapes. 
and then salt concentration because ions can also affect the bonding um, at those other levels. Okay, so let's move on to the next page. I'll um, sort of keep that last question visible, or that answer visible for right now. How would we define the optimum pH of an enzyme? It would be the pH at which the enzyme has the highest activity. Excellent, yeah, the pH at which the enzyme has uh, the highest activity. So the optimum pH of an enzyme, it can, it can be different depending on the enzyme, but whatever at whatever pH they have like the most activity, so the most product formation, uh, that is going to be your optimum pH. Um, so why is the pH of the enzymatic reaction important? It kind of alludes to this uh, previous question up here. We can just word it a different way. Um, because the pH of the environment allows the enzyme to form its 3D shape. Right, yeah, so the pH um, of the environment is uh, going to impact whether or not this enzyme is, is, is in its fully functional structure or shape. So if we alter the pH, we can potentially alter the structure and therefore functionality of the enzyme. Let's, um... I'm changing the pH of the environment. Oh, that got cut off. So yeah, changes in pH, like we mentioned up here, can denature the enzyme. And if it doesn't have that structure, it's not gonna have that function. That's the big theme here. Do all enzymes have the same optimal pH? Uh, well, each enzyme works best at a specific pH. Correct, yeah. So no, um, each enzyme is going to have its own optimal conditions. Depending on the chemical environment that it is meant to work in, so. Um, so you have certain enzymes in your stomach that have to operate at a very, very low pH. And then you've got enzymes in your blood, which operate at a more neutral pH. Okay, we're, uh, for this next question, we're going to do this like very kind of briefly, just sort of a uh, an overview of the scientific method, the steps of the scientific method, and then sort of how they related to that amylase experiment that you set up um, in your labs. So what's the first um, step of the scientific method? Question. Yeah, so we start with a, a question. So what was the general like question you were trying to answer in this lab? Work. Is this true? I, I, I think that's how you, res that, I think that's how you question. No, I think it is what, what is optimal pH. Oh yeah, so it, it's, um, you don't want it to be like too general, right? You want it to sort of point towards the topic of your experiment. So yeah, you want it, the general question was, yeah, what are the optimal conditions for amylase? Oh, I thought it was another thing, but yeah, never mind. Okay. Yeah, uh, what are the optimal conditions of the amylase enzyme? Um, and then after a question, then we would get a little bit more specific in formulating our hypothesis. So 
So give me one potential hypothesis. It kind of depended on like which uh, and amylase enzyme you were using and what um, variables you were looking at. But give me an example of a hypothesis. I would say um, an optimum temperature will increase enzyme activity and guarantee bacterial survival. Okay, so an optimum an optimum temperature will. Um, sorry, I'm blanking. What, could you repeat that, please? An optimum temperature will increase enzyme activity and guarantee bacterial survival. I did temperature for bacteria. Okay, guarantee bacterial survival. Sure. Now, typically in a hypothesis, uh, we want to have like a specific like value, something that is testable. So did you have a specific temperature that you thought was going to be optimal for this um, bacteria? I didn't. I actually okay. didn't, but I'm thinking maybe 37 degrees Celsius. Okay. Yeah, so our hypothesis is our kind of speculation, what we think is actually going on with um, the experiment we're going to perform. And so we want to make sure our hypothesis is specifical, specific, specific uh, testable, and falsifiable. So those are the conditions of a good hypothesis. Now, after the hypothesis, what comes next in the scientific method? Prediction. Prediction. Yeah, I was looking for a prediction. I think I also heard experiment in there. But yeah, so your prediction is, that's like your if-then statement. I'll just put that. So in the context of the hypothesis that we have written here, we could say, you know, if this bacteria is um, at, a at a temperature of 37 degrees, then it will have optimal amylase activity. So that would be an example of a prediction statement. Then our experiment, um, what kinds of things do we need for a good experiment? Independent variable and dependent. Right, so we're going to have to yeah, identify our variables. Our independent and dependent variables. What else should we have for a good experiment? Controls. Controls, right. Um, yeah, have some control samples. And I guess the last kind of point that you want for an experiment is, you know, something that you can measure, right? Uh, you need to make sure that whatever you're looking at is quantifiable somehow, is measurable. Um, yeah, collect quantifiable data. Then after that is prediction. Uh, prediction comes first. Oh. So the prediction is before the experiment that like, well, before I, you know, execute all of these things, I'm going to predict what I think is going to happen based on my hypothesis. Oh, okay. Then we have this statement as the, uh, as the last one. Right. Um, so after after we've done our experiment and we've collected data, what comes next? Results. Yeah, so results. Maybe I will, um, I'll put in some forward slashes to kind of break these uh, parts up. Okay. So our results and what do we do with our results or uh, what kind of results would we expect to get from this experiment? It's our result. We can see that um, our hypothesis got so set or not. That's more for your conclusion. Oh, it's conclusion. Yeah, so it's, right. um, it's easy to mix those two up. So results is you're really just talking about the data. So you're, you know, graphing the data or you're looking at the numbers in your table and you're saying, you know, like, what happened? 
So results is just um, presenting and analyzing the data. explaining what happened or yeah just explaining very clearly like you know what do your graphs look like what kind of trend is there in the data and the conclusion that's where you state whether or not your hypothesis is supported Oops. and it looks like the uh my text box got cut off a little bit Um, I had a question mm -hmm. for this. Uh, do we always do we always have to tie it back to like the amylase experiment in terms of like um, mentioning like the variables, whether or not we have control um, samples? I don't know if you understand my question. I um, treated it with, differently. So for this, well, for this particular question, just the way that it's worded, it's talking about like. Just the steps. The steps for the scientific method that you use to design your amylase experiment. So yeah, I guess you could very generally just talk about the steps of the scientific method. Um, you don't need to put it in the context of a specific experiment, but sometimes that can help um, in explaining the steps if you have got like a concrete example. Yeah, sounds good, thank you. Mm -hmm. So for this experiment, then, what were the dependent, independent, and control variables? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, so what were the, um, the variables in our amylase experiment? I want to get a text box here. So who wants to um, volunteer that? So we're, what were our variables like in this experiment? I think independent can be temperature reaction. The temperature of reaction. Temperature of reaction, yeah. So was that an independent or a dependent variable? Um, that would be the independent variable. Right. How can you tell the difference between independent and dependent variable? So the dependent variable, um, well, as the word says, depends on the independent variable. Right, yeah, so the dependent, yeah, it depends on the independent. So the independent is what you decide upon or what you change as the scientist, as the researcher. The dependent um, is basically like what you measure. So what happens as a result of these variables you were affecting up here. So what did you measure? How did you measure amylase activity basically um, in this experiment? Dr. Etz, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so just to be sure for the controls, that is just gonna be positive or negative control. Yeah, yeah. And in the context of our, um, of the amylase experiment, what did you use as your like positive or negative control? Okay. So you should have had like, if your independent variable was temperature, you should have had two tubes in a specific temperature. One of the tubes had the amylase enzyme in it and the other tube did not. Right, so tube without amylase, would that be a positive control or a negative control? Negative. Negative, yeah. So the absence of the enzyme, that would show you kind of what the results would be without any enzyme present. So does any maltose get produced um, if there's no enzyme present? Professor, can I ask two questions real yes. quick, please? Do we have to make graph on this exam? Um, no, you do not have to make, if I remember correctly, you do not have to make graphs on this exam. You're, you're going to be asked to analyze graphs. Um, I think this review packet is a little bit outdated. I don't think it's been updated um, since before, like the pandemic, basically. So we used to have students have to make graphs uh, during the exam, but 
Now you only need to analyze graphs. Okay. Um, and our dependent is always x values. Or the, independent is x value. I'm yes, kidding. the independent okay. is the x, dependent is the y. Okay, thank you. So how did we measure amylase activity? What were we actually measuring? The maltose uh, produced, was exactly. it? Exactly, yeah, maltose produced. So depending on how much maltose we um, ended up with in that tube in different temperature or pH conditions, uh, we use that to determine sort of the um, activity of the amylase enzyme. Can you please explain why the control is negative again? I just want to take note of it. So the this control is a negative control because you are um, not including sort of the active ingredient in the reaction. So the control tube would have everything that was in your reaction tube except for the enzyme. So it would have the starch, it would have yeah like the starch and water, and you would put it in the same environmental condition, like whether it was the temperature or the pH. So the only thing it's missing is the amylase and it's to kind of show you, you know, like what the results are in the absence of the enzyme. So that's what makes it a negative control. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so, Professor, a question for this, for this question, we need to answer everything, you know, specific about amylase or, or generalized question hypothesis and describe each one. This one, um, it's just, a, it really is only asking me for describing the steps of the scientific method. Um, I just use the example of our amylase experiment because it can be easier to explain some of these concepts when you have like a specific kind of concrete example. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we're looking at this uh, result from an experiment with the human amylase enzyme, and it's showing us a graph of the activity across a range of temperatures. And then it wants us to use um, some of these words to sort of describe what's going on at two specific temperatures. And we don't have to use all of these words. This is just to kind of give you um, a hint as to what we're looking for in this chart. So let's start with the, uh, the higher temperature. So 85 degrees Celsius all the way at the right end of the graph. Um, what can we say about the function of this enzyme? Is it active or inactive? Inactive. inactive. Yeah, it's definitely inactive because it's basically at the zero point on the activity scale. And what can we say about its structure? Denatured. 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 Exactly. Denatured. We can also say it's unfolded. So it has just completely, basically melted apart. It's gotten so hot that all of those special bonds holding it together um, have been destroyed. And that's why it has no activity. So what about at four degrees? So at this end of the graph, what can we say about the function and the structure of this enzyme? It's inactive too. Active. Uh, yeah, it's, I guess we could say like slightly active. It's obviously not at its peak activity, but it has more activity than at the 85 degrees. What about its structure? Properly folded. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely properly folded. It has the right structure, just maybe not enough of that heat of that kinetic energy to uh, reach its peak um, maltose production abilities. We also say correct 3D structure here. Um, so yeah, the, the main point here is that you can make that connection between the structure and function of these enzymes in different conditions. Um, Professor, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Like go over like the words in the word bank that we didn't use. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so activation energy doesn't really apply to this particular graph. Like we're not really looking at um, energy like as in the delta G. So that's really where we would see that type of graph if it was um, activity over time then we would be able to put activation energy somewhere on that graph. So this is sort of like a distracting term in this word bank. Um, same thing with transition state. So that is, again, something else you would see on a graph if it was activity versus time. We could pinpoint like, oh, this is the transition state for these molecules that are reacting. Um, heat from environment. Well, it doesn't really tell us where this heat is coming from. We can assume that it's from the environment. Um, and we could use that to explain this sort of upward trend here from four degrees to about 25 degrees, that it's this increasing heat from the environment that is allowing the amylase to be more active. So again, if you are just joining us, oops, uh, I'm going to post the, the link for the attendance sheet. Again, if you've already filled this out, then you don't need to worry about it. This is just for folks who have only recently joined. I can find where I put that link. There we go. All right, so let's scroll on down to page three. So if we had one milliliter of the fungal amylase enzyme and added it to five milliliters of a 2% starch solution, and then we held this mixture at 45 degrees for 15 minutes, um, do we think that the mixture would give a positive Benedict's assay? Yes. Okay. Yes. Why would it give us a positive Benedict? Because the maltose will produce starch. Right. Because uh, the amylase would turn the starch into maltose. And then what's the connection between maltose and the Benedict's assay? Um, the, the connection can be that it is tested for, for enzymes or something like that. Uh, well, yeah, we have to think back to that, what was it? That's basically the first lab that you all did this semester. So the Benedict's assay, what does the Benedict's assay test for? Reducing and, sugar. Sorry, reducing sugars. Right, the reducing sugars. <clears throat> and maltose was one of those reducing sugars. So if we um, had this amylase and starch reaction going, we would produce maltose and that would give us a positive Benedict's result. Um, Can we repeat the last part, please? Certainly. So we, if we mix up the amylase and the starch, so amylase as an enzyme, its job is to break down starch into maltose. And maltose, it's a disaccharide, it's also a reducing sugar. So if there's maltose present, present and we add that Benedict's reagent, the Benedict's is going to react and give us that positive reaction, which if you remember the Benedict's reagent is sort of like a light blue color and a positive reaction forms this sort of like red rusty looking precipitate at the bottom of the tube. So if there's maltose there and we add that Benedict's reagent, we'll get a positive reaction. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then um, if we took this mixture, I think it's referring to the starch and amylase mixture and heated it with that DNS, um, would we get a color change? Yes. Um, yes, we will get it. Yeah, because the DNS is, is a compound 
that um, that can that can that can detect reducing reducing sugars. Right. Yeah. So it actually reacts with the maltose. One of them gets reduced, and one of them gets oxidized. Do we remember which does which? Uh, I think DNS gets reduced and maltose is oxidized. I think you are correct. I honestly, um, it's been a minute since I've done that lab. So I forget exactly which is which, which gets reduced and which gets oxidized. I can go back really quick and look at my um, PowerPoint for that. I think maltose is reduced and DNS gets oxidized. Yes. Yes, you are you are correct. The DNS is reduced and the maltose is oxidized. Yeah. Excellent. Yes. So DNS is reduced by maltose. Yes, and that means the maltose gets oxidized. Um, so when we were doing this amylase activity uh, experiment, why did we use the DNS assay instead of the Benedict's? If they both work, if they both give us a positive result, what was the um, advantage of using that DNS assay? Well, the reason why we use DNS assay was because um, the DNS produces a soluble product, and in Benedict's assay, it's an it is an insoluble product. Okay, so that's that's one really big reason is we get a soluble product. Uh, it. I think another reason was because DNS when it reacts with maltose, it produces or like a orange color thing orange color, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. and which um, the orange color um, shows the presence of, um, is it starch or glucose? Um, the presence of the maltose. Of the maltose, excuse me. Thank right. You. Yeah, so it produces this measurable, this quantifiable change in the color. So we, it produces that soluble product, and it's also... Um, and it changes the, the color of the solution in a quantifiable way. So we could, um, we were able to um, measure the, I guess, or actually determine the amount of maltose produced uh, based on the intensity of that orange color. Uh, professor, mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, question number 10B, is it uh, DNS reduced or oxidized? DNS is reduced and the maltose is oxidized. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because the DNS is gaining an electron and the maltose is losing an electron. Okay. And Alex, I see your comments in the in the chat. You're right that the more maltose is present, the color, uh, the darker that orange color. And um, we can measure it using that spectrophotometer. And so based on how much absorbance, um, what the absorbance value is that can translate back to sort of the amount of maltose that was produced. Uh, okay, so if we performed a biuret or a bure assay on the enzymatic solution, um, it would test positive. Why is that? Well, the reason why it tests positive is because the um, is because the amylase is a protein, and the buried assay tests for for proteins. Right. Yeah. So that was our assay for detecting the presence of proteins, and amylase is definitely a protein. Uh, 
Okay. Um, always important to review um, our dilution math or, you know, calculating uh, conversion between units and then uh, dilutions in general, like we have here in 712. So let's start up here with uh, just some conversions between microliters and milliliters. So 350 microliters is going to be how many milliliters? It's going to be 0 0.35 milliliters. 0 0.35. 0 0.35. Okay, I'm going to scroll up a little bit in case uh, some folks need to still see the, the top half of the screen. Yeah, it's going to be 0 0.35. We're basically just taking the, um, I always think of it in terms of that decimal point, and we're moving it over three places, 0.35. And how many mils are going to equal 500 microliters? 0 0.5. Exactly. 0 0.5. Yeah, yeah 0 0.5 milliliters. All right, I'm going to scroll down now. Um, if you missed something from the beginning of the review session, um, I'm more than happy to at the end kind of go back and revisit questions, or you can also just wait for the uh, recording to come out and then Kind of rewatch certain segments. Uh, so for right now, let's move on to this chart where we want to concentrate, uh, we want to calculate concentration of maltose, milligrams per milliliter, and we're going to correlate that to the absorbance values here of these different solutions. So we wanted to create a standard curve. We've got a standard maltose solution five milligrams per milliliters. Uh, I just want to oops, see highlight that. And we know that our final volume of solution is, is 10 milliliters. So we're gonna be using this equation, the C1V1 equals C2V2. So why don't we take a moment to identify uh, which of these variables we already know and which ones we, which is the one that we are solving for. So C1, our starting concentration, uh, what is our C1 in this instance? Would it be the five, five milligrams? milligrams? Yeah, five milligrams, yes. So C1 is five milligrams per milliliter. Uh, what would our V1 be? Let's would it be in the alto solution? Exactly, yeah. So this column here represents our V1 values. So it's gonna change for each, um, each row that we are calculating for. What is our C2? That we don't know. Solve for. Exactly. Yeah. So C2 is going to be this column here. That's what we are, uh, that's what we're looking for. And then finally, our V2. Um, 10. That would be the 10. Excellent. Yeah. So V2 is our total volume at the end of the reaction, which is that 10 milliliters. So we're solving for C2. We know all the other parameters. So I'll set up a little example calculation down here. And I'm going to start with tube two that has 0.2 milliliters of the Malto solution. So C1 Z1 equals C2 times V2. So we're multiplying these two values together, and then we are going to divide by the 10 over here. So 
So we're going to end up with 0 0.2, oh yeah, 0 0.2 divided by, or no, sorry, 5 times 0.2 divided by 10. And what does that equal? 0 0.1. Exactly, 0 0.1 milligrams per milliliter. So that is our C2 value for this uh, row right here. Does everyone understand how I got uh, that value or how I set up this equation? Professor, mm -hmm. could you go back again? Like the, I have a question. Like the, the C one is a, is an initial concentration. Yes. But here, he does not state like his initial. How do you like recognize that the five milligram? Uh, okay. So the the way I recognize that is. Um, mm -hmm. So the the language of the question is, you know, it tells us that we're making a standard curve. Yeah. And that, um, so it's using the word volume here. That's not correct. It should say the concentration of standard maltose, or oh. no, sorry, it says the volume of standard maltose is in column two. Well, it's telling us that our, yeah, our, our starting concentration, our like stock solution. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so whenever you see that word standard, standard and you're making dilutions from the standard, you can yeah. use that to understand that that's your kind of starting concentration. Okay, start on that, okay. Another way um, is to look for these, look for the units. So you know that volume is always going to be in the units of like milliliters. Yeah. Concentration is always going to be milligrams or, or grams or nanograms per milliliter. Um, so if you look for the units, that can kind of also point you in the right direction. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so what would the next concentration be for the for tube number three? 0 0.2. Exactly. Yeah, 0 0.2 milligrams per milliliters, which, I mean, this is the value you would get if you did the calculation. Or you could also see that if you're doubling the amount of um, maltose stock solution, you're going to be doubling the concentration. All right, what would the next one be? Uh, the next one will be uh, 0 0.3. Mm -hmm. All right, and then this last one? Uh, 0 0.4. Yeah, exactly, yeah, 0 0.4. And then up here, where we had none of our standard solution added, uh, what would the concentration be? Zero. Zero. Exactly. It would be zero. All right. So these would be the values you would use to construct your um, standard curve. And I know it asks you to do that in this review guide. We're not going to make it very precisely. We're just going to kind of walk through how we would make it. Professor, what, a, what about for the unknown sample? What we need to do there? Yeah, so for the unknown, um, that's something that you're going to sort of, um, we'll talk about that once we go through how we would set up this graph, because then it will be easier to sort of uh, talk about how we would calculate this. Okay. So if I go to this next page, um, when we have our graph paper, so if we were to graph this information, uh, what would be on the x-axis and what would be on the y-axis? for making a standard curve. The uh, x-axis would be concentration and the y-axis would be absorbance. Yeah, exactly. So these would be x-axis values and then the y-axis values would be our absorbance because absorbance is gonna be dependent on how much maltose um, is in that tube. Right, and if we look at the values too, we'll notice that as we increase the concentration of maltose, absorbance is gonna increase as well. 
So we've got this positive linear relationship going on um, with these two values. So let's see, we've got, we've got absorbance on our y axis. Maltose concentration, always want to include your units. On the x axis, oh shoot, sorry about that. Okay, and if we were to kind of draw out this graph, um, since we know it's all positive linear relationship, it would look so, something like this. So, sorry, it's not a straight line. So as we increase our maltose concentration, we're also gonna be increasing the absorbance. So that's what we would expect our standard curve to look like. And then for this unknown sample, that's why we wanna make a standard curve because then if we have an, uh, a sample with an unknown amount of maltose in it, well, we can measure its absorbance and we can use that information to extrapolate what the concentration of maltose in that tube is. So we would find that absorbance value on our y-axis. Here, let's do this in a different color. So we would find wherever that 0.7 absorbance is on our y-axis, follow it across to where it intersects our standard curve line. And then we would follow that down to the corresponding maltose concentration. And then that would be the value that we associate with that unknown sample's absorbance. So if we go back up to look at this value, um, we don't even really need to make this graph to kind of um, get an estimation of this maltose concentration. Because notice this absorbance 0 0.7, it's between these two absorbance values up here, 0 0.6 and 0 0.8. So knowing how closely these, um, these two values sort of follow each other as one increases, the other increases, well, if this absorbance is halfway between these two absorbances, its concentration is probably going to be halfway between this concentration and this concentration. So what's the question? question? Yeah. So, I'm sorry. Um, so I didn't do it quite like that as far as the graph, but I just want to make sure the way that I did it is um, like right or wrong. Okay. So I was looking at the Malto solution and I see how it's like kind of um, it's two, four, six, Eight, and then I did 0 0.10. And um, I, you know, for the 0 0.10 of Malto solutions, I did the calculation and I got 0 0.05 mg ml, you know, for that part. And that is where I dropped the line down. I stopped it at the 0 0.05 instead of connecting the line to the intersecting. Um, what is this? To the line that you had there on the graph, if you scroll down. Because you use um, you found the zero point seven on right. the absorbance, and then you connected, you drew the line all the way to the initial line. Mm -hmm. I just stopped it um, and um, dropped it down at zero point zero five on the graph. To like here? Yeah, like I'll stop it there and then drop it down. I didn't bring it all the way to that line, so it has to be brought all the way to the line and just drop down at the unknown value. Right. It's not yeah. something that I can calculate on my own. Yeah, so you want to be able to make like a right angle with your standard curve. That's that's the uh cuz like this standard curve represents the relationship between these two values. Okay. So if you know one value, then you're going to use this as sort of your guide to find the other value. So you do need to like find like intersect with this line. Okay. Um, when you make your graph. Okay. So, excuse me, professor. So ba basically you take the unknown absorbent value Mm -hmm. and, and, and putting in that sorbent uh, y uh, axis and drop the line when whatever finish that is basically what we need to do yes okay yes so if you so were basically um, the absorbance is all we need right exactly yeah so okay. if you were given um like i said you're not going to need to like make a graph like this on the exam you might be given this graph and asked like oh given this absorbance value what is the concentration so you'll already have this pink line 
for example, and um, you'll have the standard curve already, and it'll be up to you to use that standard curve to find the correct concentration. Professor, mm -hmm. I have a question um, concerning at the same time. Um, so to find the unknown maltose produced, um, we have to estimate the number that as long as between um, the, I'm talking about between the 2.3, because you mentioned that it's not, when you see the numbers, is it have to be between uh, 8, 0, 8, and point two. Is that correct? Um, not sure. quite. So the, oh, okay. so our absorbance value 0. 0.7, it's halfway between these two absorbance values. Which means its concentration is going to be half. Oh yeah, okay, okay, that's what. I, okay, that's what I want to make sure because then I was like, it would be estimated as long as between um, zero point six and zero point eight, right? Right. Yeah. So okay. if this uh, absorbance value, if it wasn't really close to any of these other absorbance oh. values, it would be we wouldn't be able to do that. Okay. But um, you. you can yeah. use these number relationships as a way to yeah. No, I'm in class. I'm in class. Um, Thank you. Okay. Yes, you're welcome. Bye. Yeah, so Alex, you're absolutely right. The slope isn't exactly one. Um, so if it was exactly one, then we could say that the concentration is 0.25. The actual, like on the answer key, the answer is 0.24 milligrams per milliliter. So it's only off by, um, what is it, a hundredth of, um, a value. So at least we're like in the right ballpark, you know, we're not like wildly inaccurate. So that's what I'm saying. Like you can use the 0.25 as an approximation. The, um, the actual answer is um, 0.24. So approximating it gets us pretty close to what the actual answer is. If we were to yeah, construct this graph very precisely, or, you know, you could put these numbers into Excel and get a graph like almost immediately. Um, and it would tell you the, the correct answer. The important thing here is that you know how to use the standard curve so that if you're given a standard curve on the exam, um, you know what to do with it and how to find the right answer. All right, so let's move on. Uh, I'm, I appreciate all the questions. Thank you for, for asking your questions. This is exactly what this review session is for, is to clarify these points and um, make sure that you have a thorough understanding of all these concepts. So the, the next part of the exam review um, is talking about the bioinformatics exercise and using these websites uh, to find information about proteins, about enzymes. That's the hardest part, to be honest. Okay. Um, so on the exam, if you're taking the exam in class, so there will be a little station set up with laptops where um, you'll go to the laptop and you'll have instructions in your exam that say, you know, go to the NCBI website. It's already bookmarked for you, so you don't need to memorize the, the web address. So you just open up the page and then it tells you to input uh, a certain accession number, right? The sort of like catalog number for the protein. And then it asks you a couple of questions about that protein. So you wanna be sure that you know how to sort of derive relevant information from what the computer program like spits out at you. Um, so the only two websites you're going to need to know how to navigate are this one, the NCBI website, and then the, uh, the Emboss PepStats website. So it's just those two. And like I said, you don't need to memorize the like web address because it's going to be bookmarked for you. Mm -hmm. So, so we put in the, whatever the address or ad, whatever they ask us. Right. So, so to the, search for. 
Yeah, so the, the question in your exam will have like a number like this one and it'll say, you know, uh, enter this accession number and then you'll have to um, answer some questions like, usually the questions are like, you know, what species is this enzyme from? Like, what is the name of this protein? Um, it might ask you like, how many amino acids is this protein? Professor, um, those informations are already on the, those websites, right? So we just need to know how to distinguish them. Exactly. Yeah. So okay. let's we can do it right now with this number. Um, and if you just open up Google and um, search for NCBI, I'm I'm fairly certain that the first site that comes up is this website. So everyone, just open up a, a web page, go to NCBI, and then enter in this number. Looks like it's four ones, one, 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 and then two, four, eight, A. Yeah, um, I got amylase alpha his table. All right, uh, what organism is it from? Um, Bacillus lysenformis, I do not know how to pronounce it. Bacillus lysenformis. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's the word. All right, um, how many amino acids is it? 512. That sounds about right. So why don't I, um, let me bring up that web page and let's do that together. I, I've got way too many windows open right now. Okay. Um, let me stop the share. I will share just my Chrome tab. All right, so if we just search for NCBI, it's the first thing that comes up. And we got one, 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 two, four, eight, A. And if you, it's likely that if you just search all databases, it will come up. But if you want to be certain that you'll get a protein, then you can go just to the protein database in this drop down menu here. So these are the, yeah, this is the information that comes up. So like Herman was telling us, it's 512 amino acids long. So that's the length of the protein. Um, it tells you the source organism right here is that Bacillus lichenformis. Tells you it's a bacteria. So just, uh, yeah, being able to interpret the information that is here is, um, I think part of part of the battle, I guess, with it, knowing how to answer these questions. Um, if I wanted to know the first three amino acids of this sequence, what would I click on this site here? FASTA. Yeah, exactly, FASTA. So this FASTA link takes you to the sort of layout of the amino acids, so all 512 of them. And so the first amino acids in this case would be these three letters, M, K, and Q. You don't need to know what those, which amino acids those letters stand for. You just need to know how to find the sequence. Is that all we need to know for this question? Yes, oh, yeah, okay. for this particular question. Yeah, it's just like how to get to the site. Where do you put in that number? And then being able to kind of interpret the information that it gives you. Okay, sounds great. And for the amino acid sequence, it's always going to be the first three letters? Um, not necessarily. I mean, I think they, they change the question around a little bit. But if they ask you a question about the amino acid sequence, just know that you click on that FASTA link to, to find it. OK. So, so the question for amino acids is, is where to yeah. find it, the amino acid change? This. Um, well, they might ask you, like, yeah, what are the first three amino acids in the sequence, or uh, what's the first amino acids in, in the sequence? Um, and so you just want to know that, like, if you're already at this site and you want to know what the amino acids are of this protein, you click on FASTA. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the key there is knowing what, like, where to find this information on the site. And mm -hmm. for example, in this example, for example, the uh, first three amino acids, you go for the first three letters, right? Exactly. Yeah. The Each coda. letter 
represents a different amino acid. Yeah, so just be the first three letters in this mm -hmm. string. We need to memorize which like each letter stands for or like the we will have or something like that. No, like your instructor is just looking for like these one letter like representations of the amino acids. You don't need to know which ones uh, these actually stand for. Okay. Professor, um, in one of the assignments, we needed to find nice the polar or polar numbers. And we're, are, um, are we going to find the same question in the exam? Um, yes. So that question has to do with the other website that they're going to ask you to go to, which is the PEP stats. So if you, um, yeah, if you flip to the next page of the review packet. Um, so let's look at that. So if you, again, you can just Google emboss PEP stats and it should be the first thing that comes up. And, um, Oh, that's right. You have to take the FASTA sequence from the first site and put it in here, and then it will tell you the polar and nonpolar. Let's, uh... So let's see, I'm going to cut, or sorry, just copy those and paste them here. Right, and so for this um, site, so this is the one that tells you, well, again, it'll have the number of amino acids, and then it analyzes all the amino acids, that one letter code. And this is where it'll tell you about, you know, is it polar or nonpolar? Like, so how many of those 512 amino acids are nonpolar? How many are polar? Thank you. Mm -hmm. First, I did have a question. Yes. Like for this part, when the professor gave the assignment, I have like the, I have like the three of them. I just copy and paste it. And mm -hmm. when I enter in, in these bosses, I try to submit it. It couldn't go. I did the right things, but I don't know how I couldn't find this result for this step. Oh, interesting. So you, you got your FASTA sequences. Yeah. You put them into the yeah. search box, but it didn't give you these results. Yeah, I have the three. I have the human, the salary, the the the, the, like the bacteria. I just post all the paste all the trader, copy and paste in the bosses. He did not go. I tried several times. It Sometimes if you have a space, it might not let you. That's what was one of my problems that I had a space or a gap. Or even sometimes if you have the wording, it sometimes messes it up. So I would take off like the um, the title of the thing. Like if it was like, I think it was human or like saliva or something like that. I had yeah. to take out the spaces and the names. Try oh. that. That might help. Oh, yeah. I have like, I have to take the title out, right? Right. Yeah. So whatever, like the little like carrot symbol and then, yeah, the title of protein so it's just the the sequence i think it's yeah it's very picky about the input format yeah um okay so if you try it with just the letters um professor i have a question yep would we be doing like the copying the five, the sequence to this other website would we do all that on the exam or um yes so the, there's going to be yeah like two questions or like two sets of questions in this part of the exam. So like one little set of questions will be about the NCBI website. And then the other set will be about the uh, emboss. Okay. Um, okay. okay, thank you. Yep. All right. Um, it looks like we might've had some more people come in. So I'm just gonna post once again, the, uh, the link to the attendance form. Again, if you've already filled this out, then you don't need to worry. Uh, this is just for the folks who have come in and not done this yet. Uh, 
Sorry, what part say the number of amino acids? Uh, could you repeat that, please? Yes, in what part does it say the number of amino acids? Uh, on the emboss site, oops. Um, so on this particular site, it has it near the top of the readout. It says residues. So residues is just another term for amino acids. Sometimes they're called amino acid residues or just residues. But that number indicates the number of amino acids. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And the other information we get from down, right? The non-polar and polar. Right? right, yeah. This is like if you have to like scroll down. Um, and this is where you have like the different properties of amino acids and gives you the number and then also like the percentage of the protein that's made up of that type of amino acid. Mm All right, I'm going to um, click out of these sites now and go back to the, the review handout. There we go. Uh, so these examples, these screenshots of the websites are good because it kind of you know, has these red boxes around some of the um, important parts that you'll need to use. Like here on the, the screenshot of the emboss site, it shows you where you can find the number of amino acids or residues, and then where to find the information about nonpolar or polar amino acids. Um, professor? If, if you go back to page five, what does the four, the red box of the 499 AA stand for? AA is shorthand for amino acid. Okay. So this is also oh, another way to find out the number of amino acids in the sequence. Okay, thank you. So maybe... Just write a little note to yourself that amino acids is the same thing as residues, is the same thing as just two lowercase a's. All right, so let's move along to page eight. Um, well, here it's asking us like a very general question about how do the amino acids outside of the active site contribute to the function of the enzyme? So what do we think? How would so we know that the active site is really important, right? That's what gives an enzyme its specificity. That's kind of like the business part of the molecule that's doing all the work. But what about all those other like hundreds of amino acids? What do they have to do um, with the enzyme? They like help keep the shape or structure. Yeah, exactly. So the amino acids outside the active site, even though they're not the ones like doing the chemical reaction, they're not making and breaking bonds, they still help stabilize the whole thing, you know, especially for um, these organisms that live at different pHs or at very high temperatures, they need a lot of stability in that molecule to, for it to actually like withstand those conditions. Um, we're looking at 
overall stability of the molecule. or temperature conditions. Okay, next we're moving on to exercise 10, which was all the molecular biology um, techniques, so PCR, restriction digest, and electrophoresis. And if you have not- Professor, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, a question, uh, what we need to know about this table here, app? Um, this table is just sort of, um, I don't know why they included this entire table. Um, maybe just to, sort of drive home the fact that, you know, these amylases, even though they're from three different organisms, three very different organisms, you know, bacteria, a fungus, and human beings, um, the most important thing to note is that the amino acids that make up the active site are exactly the same across all three organisms. So that area has been conserved, like we say this uh, in terms of like evolution, evolutionarily those um, the amino acids in the active site have been conserved because this enzyme does the same thing for all three organisms. It has the same substrate, it's going to make the same product, even though it's operating in completely different organisms. So even though it's very, very similar, there are still some differences, like look at the total number of amino acids. And then when we looked at the uh, optimal temperature and pH, that's going to vary widely between these different um, versions of amylase. Okay. So um, I think this table is just meant to give you sort of like a big picture of, you know, the bioinformatics um, tools like the, the NCBI site and the MBOSS PEPSTATS website. It helps us sort of compare these, um, you know, proteins or enzymes from different organisms and get like a bigger picture of like what has stayed the same over millions of years and then what has changed over time. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, don't feel like you need to memorize these values or anything. It's not about that. It's really just to, I guess, illustrate, um, yeah, the fact that the active site is gonna be conserved. The rest of the enzyme is quite different, but that's okay because these organisms live in different conditions. So they're gonna need different types of molecule stability. Um, yeah, okay, Alex, I'm just seeing your message now. Yes, so the active site is the same, but then other like environmental conditions or like the way that the organism lives is gonna be different. And so that's what, um, that's what contributes to the differences in the number of amino acids and even like the secondary and tertiary structures of the amino acids. So if I remember correctly, the, uh, the bacterial enzyme had more I think like beta sheets because it's at such a high temperature. The fungal amylase is more alpha, the alpha helices. Uh, yeah, so the structure is going to change depending on what environmental conditions um, the organism lives in. Um, if you have not yet looked at these links or followed these links, these are great kind of. Um, great reminders of sort of the important concepts of these different activities. And uh, it, I think it's, they're also pretty fun, like little animations. So it's a great way to help you visualize like what's going on at a very tiny scale, because we can't actually see the restriction enzymes working or the PCR working, but um, these sites do a good job of kind of creating this um, a visual representation of what's going on. All right, so let's go with, uh, we'll start with the PCR. So the main steps of a polymerase chain reaction, there's three of them. 
there is um, denaturation in which the DNA opens up. Right, so the DNA double helix opens up. Then we have the annealing, and then we have the, um, let me check the other one, extension. Right, so what happens in annealing? Shouldn't the temperature increase to um, 55 to 65 degrees? Um, and then the temperature actually decreases. Oh, temperature decreases. Mm -hmm. So I think the nucleotides bind to each template of the DNA. Right, the primers are going to bind. Yeah, that's what we mean by annealing. That's another, annealing is another word for kind of like coming together, or like gluing. The temperature decreases and the primers uh, bind to the template strand. And then in extension, temperature is gonna increase again. And what happens in extension? Primers are extending, I think. Yeah, so the primers are extended by what enzyme? I don't know how to say it, Polymer, polymerase? Polymerase, yeah, exactly. So DNA polymerase is going to extend where those primers have been put down. It's just going to extend and um, make a copy of our template strand. Um, so for those of you uh, asking in the in the chat, some of you have messaged me privately, um, the recording. So once we are done with this review session, I'm going to um, upload the recording to YouTube, which takes honestly a couple hours. It's going to be a very long file. And then once it's uploaded to YouTube, then I will share the link to the 150 instructors who will hopefully send it all out to you. Uh, if you don't trust your instructor or you want to have like direct access to getting the recording, um, you can email me and just say, hi, can you please, you know, email me the link when it's ready and then I will respond with that. So uh, realistically, since our session doesn't end until 3 p.m., um, I'm thinking like the earliest, it'll probably be up and ready to go is maybe like 8 p.m. tonight. So um, if you, you know, I'll try to get it to everyone by tonight. So the, the temperatures that the PCR reaction occurs in uh, are pretty high, pretty elevated. But the special thing about this TAC DNA polymerase is it's not denatured in these high temperatures. It's able to repeatedly um, extend those primers. So why is it so resilient and why is it so resistant to heat? Because it's in natural environment it's in the hot springs yes exactly so the tac dna uh, polymerase is derived from a it's derived from thermos aquaticus which is an organism that lives in high temperatures exactly yeah so it's a heat loving bacterium bacterium called thermos aquaticus so it's natural environment is a hot spring and it is very resistant to high heat. So this uh, this first little word here, TAC, this is T-A-Q, which stands for, you know, the T is for thermos and then the A-Q represents the aquaticus. So we just call it TAC polymerase, but it actually stands for Thermus Aquaticus DNA polymerase. So we're gonna, yes. 
I'm sorry. Um, can you give an example from the question? A quick example. I'm still don't understand that part. Uh, a quick example of of which one? Question talking about the PCR reaction. The that you actually the the one that you just talked about. It. This one. Yes. Um. I'm not sure what you mean by an example, like an example of how this works. Or... Yes. Yes. Okay. So the um, so the DNA polymerase that's an enzyme that we have in our cells too, right? And uh, the purpose of DNA polymerase, its its job in any cell is to um, extend DNA strands uh, during DNA replication. So we have DNA polymerase in our cells, but in our cells, it's going to work at an optimal temperature of about 37 degrees Celsius, because that's our body temperature. Um, this organism, it's a bacterium, but it lives in this really hot environment. It lives in basically boiling water. And so all of its enzymes are incredibly heat resistant. Its enzymes are not going to denature at really high temperatures. Whereas if you put a human DNA polymerase into boiling water, it would be inactivated almost instantly. It would not survive that kind of heat. Right. Um, so that's why we use this DNA polymerase from this specific organism, because it lives in such high temperatures that um, you can heat it up to near boiling and it's fine. It's still functional. And then you can cool it down and heat it up again and it still works. It's not going to denature. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, okay, so speaking of DNA replication versus PCR kind of leads into this next question. What are some of the differences between DNA replication, say, like that happens inside of our cells and then the steps of a PCR reaction? Well, the main difference is that uh, PCR is an in vitro process which synthesizes DNA, while DNA is into is in the vivo process of DNA synthesis. Right, that's a great uh, first first step. So, um, DNA replication can is kind of in vivo; it's happening inside of living organisms, whereas in PCR, it's happening in a little reaction tube. And I heard someone else um, start to speak up. So if you want to. Yeah, I just wanted to ask if you could go just up just a little bit. I was missing something. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And. Um, um, sorry, Professor, what is in vitro? In vitro, um, it's basically anytime something's happening like inside of a tube. Okay. like outside of a body. So in vivo is like in a living organism. In vitro means that's like ex vivo. It's like it's not in a living organism. Like it's an experiment like that scientists use mostly of the times. Right, yeah. So you can react on things and it's not always in um, inside of a living thing. Oh, so Alex, I see your uh, question about the primers. Does it use DNA primers instead of RNA primers? Um, I believe you are correct, yes. So obviously, yeah, in our cells, we're using RNA primers that are made by RNA polymerase. In PCR, we can use the DNA primers. We can basically design the primers to target whatever sequence you want to make copies of. Uh, what about the number of copies produced? How many copies do of DNA do we get in DNA replication? How many copies are we getting in PCR? Um, DNA replication, I think, is two, right? Yeah. Yeah, you're just making... The other one is, like, a lot. Yeah. Makes, um, you know, millions or billions of copies. But a lot. Makes a lot of copies. 
And what about what is being copied? What do we copy in regular DNA replication? And what are we copying in a PCR reaction? Uh, in DNA replication, I think uh, copying the entire genome. Yes. Yeah, so we're making one complete copy of absolutely all the genetic material within a cell. And how is that different from the PCR? And I think in PCR, uh, we, I mean, only copying the target sequence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, only copying a target sequence, exactly. So it's like in PCR, it's like you're only making a photocopy of a single page of a book, whereas in DNA replication, you are making a, a copy of every single page of that one book. All right, so I think that's pretty good about differences between those two reactions or those two processes rather. Oh yes, temperature. Yeah, we can talk about the temperature differences. So within our cells, uh, the temperature for replication is It's going to be consistent. Right? We don't have like these wild swings in temperature within our own cells when DNA is replicating. And then how is that different in the PCR? Um, you heat it and then you cool it down and then heat it again, right? Yeah. Yeah, so we go through these cycles, these heating cooling cycles. And there is a way to actually mathematically calculate about how many copies of DNA you're making in PCR. So if we were to put a reaction in for 20 cycles, assuming that we started with a single copy or like a single strand of DNA, how many copies would we get after 20 cycles? Would it be two to the power of 20? Yes, exactly. Yeah, so we calculate it as two, um, where is that symbol? Two to the power of 20. You would get a million. Let's see. Two to the power of 20, uh, yes. So it looks like 1,048,000 and some change. Yeah, you get that. And the way we calculated that, so it's a kind of a standard formula two to the n power, where n equals your number of cycles. All right, the next few questions, we're talking about that um, hemoglobin allele, right? So we're looking at the hemoglobin allele and the, the wild type, and then the dysfunctional one, which is the HBS allele. Um, so we had two different alleles, and what was the difference between these alleles? Um, one of them had a mutation for sickle cell. Yeah, what kind of mutation was it though? Sickle cell disease. So right, the mutation caused sickle cell disease, 
But the mutation itself, we're talking about a, a difference in the DNA sequence, right? So what was that difference? Was it a large difference? Was it a, oh yeah, Alex, you got it. A single amino acid change. The uh, HBS allele uh, differed from the HBA in a single amino acid. Uh, it was actually, I believe it's amino acid seven, like it's seventh from the beginning of the protein sequence. And then how did this single amino acid change translate to sickle cell disease? What was the consequence of this amino acid change? Uh, resulting the protein hydrophobic. Yeah, it uh, it revealed a or yeah it, the amino acid that was sort of um, what's the word I'm looking for uh, the amino acid that was sort of switched into place. Um, what well, caused the caused the hydrophobic uh, residue to be revealed or sort of exposed on the outside of the protein. Um, region to be exposed. And the hydrophobic regions, when you have a lot of these proteins and they all have these hydrophobic regions exposed, they're all gonna clump together. Alex, that's a good question. I believe it was a hydrophobic amino acid that just um, that changed the shape, but also caused the clumping. Um, so when these hydrophobic beta globin, beta hemoglobin molecules clumped together, it distorted the shape of red blood cells. And I'm just going to abbreviate red blood cell there. So, okay, if we understand that these two alleles, they had um, slightly different DNA sequences, right? Just a single amino acid change which actually came down to a single um, DNA nucleotide change. I think that's what it was. It was a nucleotide difference. Single amino acid. Single nucleotide change. Um, how are we able to distinguish between the wild type and the disease alleles in the lab exercise? How did we reveal, you know, who had the HBA allele and who had the HBS allele? Because um, the, I think the HBA, that's the normal one, right? Um, yes. Yeah, the, it would cut, the, the D, they would cut the DNA. And then right. the HBS would be left whole. Right, yeah, so the HBA allele had a restriction site. Um, so the, uh, the gene was cut by the restriction enzyme. We got two pieces. And then the HBS, um, the HBS allele, they, it had that mutation in the restriction site. And so it was not able to be cut. So it just remained in one piece. Uh, 
Ah, single nucleotide polymorphism. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, let's put that, we'll put that in a little text box up here. So the type of um, mutation in the HBS allele, single nucleotide polymorphism, also called an SNP or a SNP. All right, so this question asks us about these two primers and which one will have a higher annealing temperature. So how do we determine annealing temperature? And what do these nucleotides have to do with the annealing temperature? I think the annealing temperature is depend, depends on the amount of G and C in a sequence. Mm -hmm. by um, number of GC residues or yeah, GC nucleotides. And why is that? Why do the GCs have, um, need a higher temperature for annealing? Because it requires higher heat. Yes, higher heat. Why does it need higher heat? Because they're joined by uh, heat. Hydrogen bonds. Exactly. Yeah. So we have two hydrogen bonds between adenine and thymine, but between the um, Gs and Cs, we've got three hydrogen bonds. I'm just going to, oh, that looks kind of weird. <sighs> I don't know how I'm going to uh, represent that. Maybe we'll just draw it out. Nope. Three H bonds. Okay. All right. So if we were to compare the annealing temperatures of these two, let's see, we've got one, two, Seven, eight, nine, ten. So ten G and C residues in this first one. And then here we've got one, two, three, seven, eight. So in that in that case, you're counting the G's? Yes, I'm counting G's and C's. So there were eight G's or C's in this sequence and then 10 in this sequence. Oh, I get it. So the top one has a slightly higher annealing temperature. Do you mind explaining that? Sure. Uh, let me bring up uh, some slides really quick. Just cause the, my ability to like, scroll or you know kind of draw on these slides or on this um pdf is a little bit limited all right now let me share yes Okay, so if we're looking at the strand of DNA, and now these uh, these dotted lines represent the hydrogen bonds between the nucleotides. So adenine and thymine are only joined by two hydrogen bonds. Guanine and cytosine are always joined by three hydrogen bonds. It takes more energy to make and break three hydrogen bonds versus two hydrogen bonds. So the more Gs and Cs you have in your primer sequence, the higher that annealing temperature needs to be in order to facilitate making those bonds. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So again, basically you count the keys in the T's to figure it out what exactly. is the uh, highest number. 
Right. Yeah. So whichever one had more G's and C's, that's the one that has the higher annealing temperature. Thank you. What did you say as far as what they stand for? You said guamine and thymine. Can you um, spell it out? Sure. Please? Yeah. Let me uh, get another text box going. G is guanine. C is cytosine. Thank you. And then we've got, of course, our adenine and thymine as well. I'm sorry. So you said during the annealing process, we are creating bonds on the between the primer and the template. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, because the annealing is you're basically kind of like gluing that primer onto the template strand, so the DNA polymerase knows what to copy. And so we need a little bit more energy to make those three hydrogen bonds. All right, so looking at the time and also where we are in this packet, I think we're in a good shape to uh, take a little break. Let's take a 15 minute break. So stretch your legs, get a drink of water, make some phone calls, hug your pet, uh, do whatever you need to do. And again, if you're just joining us or if you haven't yet um, done the attendance form, I'm gonna post that link again really quick. Um, if you would like me to send you a link to the recording once it's up on YouTube, that's going to happen later tonight. Uh, feel free to send me an email. So I'm going to post a little sign here. So in case anyone joins now that they know that we're taking a little break. So it's my time says 1252. So what is that? 107. So that'll be 15 minutes from now. So at 1.07 p.m. we are going to resume. So I will see you then. All right, welcome back everybody. So we're gonna dive back into uh, the review with question eight or 10.8 rather. So the difference between sickle cell disease and sickle cell trait. And we usually abbreviate those SCD and SCT. Excuse me, so uh, what are the genotypes and phenotypes of the disease? Here's something I found on the web. So for sickle cell disease, both of the alleles have the mutation. Right, so it's gonna be HBS, HBS uh, genotype. And then how does the disease present itself like in a person? Well, so um, a way which it presents is that uh, the um, this is the sickle cell trait carry only one copy of the altered hemoglobin mm -hmm. in comparison with, with the sickle cell disease it carries two copies of the altered um, hemoglobin gene right so those are the genotypes so what alleles the person has and then the phenotypes so how you know sort of like the outward presentation of the genotype is slightly different too the so how the phenotype of, of someone with the disease, um, their red blood cells will have a different shape. Yes, yeah, so they have the uh, the sickle shape um, versus the round shape on a normal person. Yeah, or a person with another disease. So yeah, and that's someone who just has one copy of this disease allele who has the sickle cell trait. Uh, I mean, they they do have the mutation, so some of their cells are going to have uh, the sickle shape, but it's not as severe, right?
so they can still uh people with the sickle cell trait they can still have like the uh the sickle attacks where you have a lot of blood uh blood cells getting stuck in like the smaller capillaries the small vessels but it just doesn't happen quite as frequent frequently as when you have the uh, disease and what type of inheritance um, sort of passes this trait along? So if we need two of the alleles, two copies of alleles to have the disease, uh, what kind of trait is that or what kind of inheritance pattern does that represent? Autosomal recessive? Yeah, exactly. It's going to be autosomal because it happens on uh, chromosome seven, I believe, uh, autosomal recessive. So recessive because you need two copies of that disease allele in order to have the disease. Okay, jumping back into talking about PCR. So there are four main kind of ingredients for a PCR reaction. So let's name those ingredients and what the purpose of each one is. Well, one of the main components of a PCR um, is uh, DNA template, enzyme tag polymerase, primer, and nucleotides. Right, so template DNA, primers, the, uh, the tag polymerase, and then free, I hate that they don't okay, I have to add that in my own little text box. And then the last ingredient are the, uh, the free nucleotides. The NTPs. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, free nucleotides. Yeah, the free nucleotides. Um, so what's the purpose of each of these? Just really briefly. Uh, DNA template is to uh, uh, the DNA sample to be uh, amplified. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah, and then the uh, the primers uh, to specify the sequence to be copied. Exactly. Yes. Okay, the DNA polymerase. Uh, to extend the primers to copy target sequence. Mm -hmm. Right, and then the free nucleotides, what do those do? Make new strands. Right, that's just the, yeah, kind of the raw material for building new strands. Okay, and then what are some of the sort of um, uses for PCR technology? How can we utilize? Well, the most famous one, as we know, is for COVID-19 tests. Right. The most famous of all and the most effective one. Um, we also have uh, for DNA tests, for example, a crime, a crime scene. Forensics. Right, yeah, forensics. And paternity. Paternity, yeah. To identify individuals. Um, I guess I would fall under forensics, identifying individuals, yeah, from like biological material. And DNA tests can count for fraternity as well. That's true, yeah. So paternity and forensics. Um, archaeology. Yes, archaeology. So identifying people from very, very long time ago. How about for diagnosis disease? Yes, yeah. So in addition to COVID-19 diagnosis, you can also do other di uh, disease diagnoses. Oops. Yeah, excellent. All, all excellent um, answers there. All right, let's move on to page 10. So now we're talking about nucleases. So nuclease, we 
the way that word is written kind of gives us a hint as to what this is and what it does. They're proteins. Right, they're proteins, they are enzymes. Made of amino acids. Exactly. Right, so then there's uh, different types of nucleases. They can be endo or exo. So what does that distinction mean? Shouldn't endo nucleus be when it is, um, when it catches the DNA? So they, they both are responsible for cutting DNA. So the endo and exo refers to where in a sequence they cut DNA. I think the endo catches, cuts the DNA inside and the exo cuts the DNA outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the endo is for cutting DNA that's like within a sequence and exonucleases just kind of trim the ends of like a linear DNA sequence. So then there's a subtype of endonuclease called a restriction endonuclease. So what does that distinction mean? Uh, an enzyme that cuts a specific uh, sequence. Right. At a specific sequence. Yes, yeah, so the, uh, the restriction part of it is referring to the fact that and this enzyme is only going to cut the DNA at a very specific site. So it's looking for almost like a target sequence that it recognizes, and that is the location where it will cut the, uh, the sequence or the strand. Okay, so which restriction endonuclease did you use in your lab? What was it called? EDEF. Yeah, the D, D, E, I, or it's like the uppercase I, I think it represents the number one. So D, D, E, one or D, D, E, I. And does this um, enzyme produce sticky ends or blunt ends? It's sticky ends. Right, so it produces sticky ends, which means there is uh, like a single strand overhang where the cut is made. An important feature of these restriction sites where these endonucleases cut uh, is the palindrome of the sequence. So what does it mean if a DNA sequence is a palindrome? The same forwards and backwards. Right. So the uh, the sequence is the same, read forwards and backwards. And in the terms of DNA, because it's a double-stranded molecule, what we mean is reading the sequence on one strand from five prime to three prime. It's going to be identical on the opposite strand. Um, from five prime to three prime. Right, so just uh, if I can draw like a little visual here. So we've got our two strands of DNA. And if this is five to three on one strand, then the opposite strand, we're always going to have a, a three prime end opposing a five prime end on the other strand. So the palindromic sequence means it's going to read the same in this direction and then on the opposing strand in the other, in the five to three direction. So we think of reading left to right as reading forwards and reading right to left as the backwards part. 
Um, so there will be at least one question on your exam where you're asked to identify a palindrome sequence. And the easiest way to do that, that I recommend students go about doing it, is if you imagine that this is a five prime to three prime sequence, then just write in underneath this the complementary sequence and see if it's the same reading in the five to three direction. So we have AAGGTT, and what would the complementary strand read? It's going to be TT, CC, AA. Mm -hmm. Right, TT, CC, AA. So now when we compare these two, so when we read the top strand left to right, AAGGTT, and then let's read the bottom strand from right to left, it's AACCTT. So that's not a match. Those are not identical. So that means this is not a palindrome. So let's do the same thing for the next sequence. I have a question. Yeah. For the first one, where, where is the CC coming from? Uh, C, because C is what binds complementary to the G. Okay. okay. Oh, okay. true. Um, a, it like for RNA, it's like A is T. Sorry, no, my bad. Ah. My bad, that was for RNA, my, my bad, R A is superior to you, my bad. Right, yeah, so we're talking about, yeah, double-stranded DNA here, so it's the yeah. A-T relationship. So that one can be T-T, T-T-T, T -T -T um, so No, C-C-C, I'm sorry. Right, yeah, so this one's going to be C-C-C, G-G-G. G-G-G. So now let's look at this one. So reading the top strand from left to right, G, 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 C, C, C. And then when we read the bottom strand from right to left, G, 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 C, C, C. So this one is a palindrome because it's reading the same in each five to three direction. And then the next one would be correct as well, right? The third, the third one. Let's oh. take a look. So it's not the first one then? No, the first one is not a palindrome. So this one would be, so I guess we have TA, TA, TA. So yeah, if we read the top strand, top strand AT, 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 bottom strand AT, AT, AT. So yes, third one, also a palindrome. So in other words, to um, see if it matches, as long as the first letters match up to the second bottom right letters, right? Like uh, you're, well, when you're reading it, you're looking at the first letters, and then when you read it on the second part, the second part, the right should match up to the top left. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, well, you want to make sure the whole sequence matches though, like you can't just rely on the first two letters like okay it works in this example with the GG and GG, but like if you look at the first one up here AA, and then the bottom right is AA well that matches, and actually the end of the sequence matches but it's the the middle part that isn't the same. So I would still recommend kind of looking at the whole sequence of reading them left to right and right to left. So this one would be... Professor? Yes. I'm looking at 2B. Uh, so the sequence is the same red forward and backward, but I'm seeing 5 to 3, 5 to 3. Is it not 3 to 5? Um, no, because um, since DNA is a double-stranded molecule, and we always read DNA in the 5 prime to 3 prime direction, we think of that as forwards. So five prime to three prime is always the direction you read DNA. And I guess the terms forwards and backwards, you can think of like how you typically read like English text or like the English language that we're used to reading English left to right. That's our forward direction and backwards would be right to left. Um, so we wanna make sure that the sequence is identical in both of those directions, but they both happen to in the world of DNA be of the orientation of five prime towards three prime. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so this last um, sequence here, is this a palindrome? No, it's not. No, definitely not. Yeah, so it's completely different there. So just two and three are the palindromes. Wait, so just to be clear, Professor, um, mm -hmm. G gets replaced with C in the three to five prime sequence. Right, yeah, that's the complementary base pairing is G is always with C and A is always with T. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, this next question is about um, if we have multiple restriction sites that are cut and how many fragments can be produced. Um, and we can represent this mathematically or kind of come up with a mathematical like formula to calculate this. So if we have a linear piece of DNA, right? So here's our DNA. And we cut it once, how many fragments are we going to end up with? Oops. It's going to be two. Two, yeah. Two hours. Right, so if we have a, a piece of string and we cut it in half, we're gonna get two pieces of string. Oops. Okay, so, so cutting linear DNA once leads to two fragments. If we cut it twice, how many fragments are we going to produce? No, three. Three, right. So cutting it twice means we get three fragments and so on. So how can we represent that mathematically? What kind of formula um, would, that, would that look like? Number, number of fragments equals Let's say um, N represents the number of cuts. Plus one. Plus one, yeah. N is the, the number of restriction sites or the number of cuts. This one has something to do when it's a circular DNA in linear? Exactly, yeah. So if we had a circular piece of DNA and we cut it once, oops, control D that. Let's go back to my DNA color. Yeah, so if we had a circular piece of DNA and we cut it once, we would end up with just an open strand of DNA and it would just be one piece. Right, so if we had a circle, a continuous circle, and we cut into it, it would just kind of unravel and open up. And so it'd still be one whole piece. So the N plus one only refers to if you're starting with linear DNA. If you have circular DNA, then the number of fragments equals the number of cuts. Yeah, so this is only applicable to the uh, linear DNA. Professor, I guess I'm not understanding how do they relate, exactly how do they relate based off of what you have here? So the, um, if you wanna calculate the number of fragments you get based on the number of restriction sites, if you're calculating it for a circular piece of DNA, the number of fragments equals the number of cut sites or restriction sites. In linear DNA, the number of fragments equals N plus one. So it's the number of cuts plus one.
Okay. All right. So I guess I could write like. Uh, so, Professor, excuse me. A question uh, for this can be like: Is how is the stay here, or they can, or they can give for this linear, uh, linear DNA? How many fragments? I don't know. Yeah, exactly. It would be a. Um, I think it's a, a multiple choice question or something on the exam where that says, you know, a linear piece of DNA is cut three times. How many fragments are produced? And so then you say, oh, well, that's if it's cut three times, three plus one is four. So it'd be four fragments. So maybe it's, it's a good idea to try to draw in into the cuts and count the fragments, right? Yeah, you can always do that. I, I'm, that's kind of my strategy. I'm like a very like visual person when it comes to understanding these kinds of concepts. So yeah, you could either memorize these two little formulas or you could just draw it out on the paper and, and figure it out that way. I'm a little confused with the circular one, for example, you just explained, uh, in that circular, you cut once, so there is two fragments. So say if, if the circular is cutting in three fragments, so it's going to, it's going to be four, two, not one. Three, so for like this circle I've drawn here, if I cut this circle once, all I'm doing is opening it up. So now instead of being one circular piece, it's just going to be one linear piece, right? It's going to look like this after I cut it open. Oh, right, right. So it's just one fragment. But if I cut this twice, if I if I cut it twice, then I would end up with two fragments down here because it'd be like two pieces now. Got it. Thank you. All right, I'll try to leave that last question visible while we move on to the next one on the next page, talking about electrophoresis. Um, isn't the electrophoresis the separation of DNA protein, of DNA, RNA, and proteins based on their size and charge? Yeah, exactly. So it's a uh, separation of really, you could use any molecule, um, but you're right that you can do it with DNA or RNA or protein. So you're separating molecules based on their size and their charge. And the electro part of the electrophoresis means you're using an electrical current to achieve this. So we can add that in there. So using an electrical current uh, to separate molecules. And that's basically like the answer to the next question as well. What does agarose gel electrophoresis allow us to do? Well, we're separating molecules based on their size using electricity. In this case, we are separating DNA. based on the fragment size. And we're using this agarose gel. So it asks us about what is agarose, like chemically, how does it behave or, you know, why is this used? Polysaccharide. Right, Ag agarose is a polysaccharide. And it forms a 3D mesh and hold together with the hydrogen bonds. Right. Yeah, so it kind of forms like this um, woven sort of web or mesh, a three-dimensional mesh. And so when you're passing these molecules through it, uh, larger molecules are going to get caught up in this mesh and they're not going to travel as far as the smaller molecules. Uh, 
Um, so I mentioned that the larger molecules get stuck um, sooner than the smaller molecules. So that's one thing that affects the migration rate of DNA through the agarose gel is just that fragment size. What else can affect migration rate? Um, higher voltages and the, and, and the size of the agarose. Voltage of the electricity used, right. And then the, yeah, basically the, the density of that agarose gel. So is it like a really open mesh, uh, like a butterfly net or something? Or is it like a very, very tight, dense mesh that's not gonna allow much of anything to pass through? Density, or I guess you'd also say the concentration um, of agarose. So doesn't the shape affect it? Oh, yes, that's right. I always forget the DNA shape. Uh, DNA shape, so whether it is linear or circular or coiled or super coiled. Yeah, that will also affect how it moves through. So when we uh, did this electrophoresis experiment, we had our samples, and then we also had something called a ladder that we ran alongside it. So what was the purpose of that DNA ladder? To estimate the size of the fragments. Yeah, so the DNA uh, ladder. In the sample. Yeah, we can use it to estimate the size of the fragments in our sample. So it, it's a type of standard because it contains fragments of known sizes and then we can use that and compare it to uh, the fragments of like unknown or undetermined sizes from our experimental samples. Okay, we're asking for some practical applications for restriction analysis. So being able to cut DNA at specific sites, what might that be useful for? Uh, genetic engineering and insulin. Yeah, yeah, so genetic engineering in that you can take a gene from one organism and express it in a different one. Like in making human insulin using bacterial cells. Also diagnostic cloning. Uh, yeah, we can use it in diagnostics like with this um, a uh, sickle cell example. Agriculture. Agriculture, yeah. So kind of another um, aspect of the genetic engineering. So we can sort of splice together desirable traits for crops or animals. Uh, yeah, those are all excellent answers. How about, is the COVID vaccine technically then also? The COVID vaccine, I don't the know MRI. if they use restriction analysis for it. Oh, okay. Um, well, yeah, because like the whole thing is because they're like mRNA vaccines. Right, so, so they, not all COVID by nineteen vaccines. Did they use MR? Did they use restriction analysis for the mRNA development part of it? Those details I'm not sure of. So, well, okay, I was just curious. All, and yeah, Professor, let's say that not all vaccines were made of mRNA. Right. Yeah, you're you're correct in that. Not all of them are the mRNA vaccines. Just the uh, I think the Pfizer and the Moderna were like the the main ones. I think there's. 
or is Johnson and Johnson also mRNA? No, that's made from an inactive virus. Insane. Oh, okay. Those for the oh, that's right. So it was the single dose one. That's right. There's so many of them out now. Hard to keep track of them all. All right. Uh, so let's look at this question with the the restriction sites. So the arrows are indicating what where the like covalent bonds are going to be broken in these double strands. Uh, which enzyme is not going to make sticky ends? Yeah, yeah this last one. So the two ends, uh, the two arrows are opposing each other. And so that is going to create these blunt ends with no little overhang. Okay, let's move along to page 12. And we're looking at the results of an electrophoresis experiment after restriction enzyme digest. Professor? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Can I see the last part for the, just one second? Yeah, cross off. Okay, no problem. Well, professor, could you just explain one more time why it's um, that, that's the answer? For this last one? Yes. So the, um, the sticky ends refers to, <laughs> I'll scroll up a little bit more. So the, the sticky ends refers to the little overhang here. So you can imagine um, if we have an enzyme that's cutting the sequence at this arrow and this arrow, well, it's also going to be cutting here in between these nucleotides. So basically we're gonna end up with uh, these two strands and each strand is gonna have a little bit of this like um, single strand overhang. Uh, it's only a couple of nucleotides long. It's just like a four letter long overhang, but we refer to the, the, uh, those ends as sticky ends because you can easily kind of like stick them onto another uh, piece of DNA that has a complementary sort of sequence there. And it's easy to kind of like glue things together that way in a molecular sense. So in this example, we have, uh, and over here, we have just like a clean cut down the middle, and that's going to produce what we call blunt ends because there's no overhang. So it's just like clean cut. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, Professor. So basically, there are the arrows that are in each end of the template. Exactly. Yeah. So you want to look at the positioning of the arrows and if the arrows are directly opposing each other, that's going to make a clean blunt end. And if the arrows are kind of off, off center from each other, if they're not directly opposing each other, that's going to create the sticky end. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, the folks who asked me to scroll up, I hope you've gotten what you needed. Thank you. And um, so now we're looking at the results of the uh, restriction enzyme digest and then gel electrophoresis. So we've got bands, these fragments of DNA that's been separated by size. And this is another one where like the the review guide asks you to make a graph, but you're not actually gonna to have to graph this on the exam. It's really just to, again, to kind of like illustrate a concept and make sure you understand sort of the relationship between these different variables. Um, so there's a couple ways you could do this. You could um, physically measure like with a ruler and it actually has like a ruler here lined up. You could measure the distance that each band traveled from its starting point, which is these uh, wells at the top of the gel. And so you can measure the distance of the latter bands and then your unknown bands, and then determine the size that way. Or usually what people do is they kind of like eyeball, basically, um, they horizontally move across so that if this band is up here, 
they're going to move across to the ladder and see which band it corresponds to in the ladder and say, oh, okay, so C is about 7,000 base pairs long, that fragment, because it's in the same position as that ladder band. Um, so like on this example here, we've got like the DNA ladder fragments and then their migration distance. So the ladder fragments would just be these values here. So how big are these pieces in the standard? And then the distance would be if you took a little ruler and lined up zero with the position of the well, how far down are each of these bands? How many millimeters? So the 8,000 base pair is, I believe, about six millimeters. And then all the way to the 500 base pair, which is 55.5 millimeters. So the thing to notice here is obviously the, the values of our ladder fragments as we go down this chart. The number, the size of these fragments is going to get progressively smaller. The distance, however, is this number getting larger or smaller, the migration distance? It's getting larger. It's getting larger, right. So as this, everything in the left column, as these numbers get smaller, in the right column, the numbers get larger. So we've got this inverse relationship. So we've got an inverse relationship between the variables as, as the fragment size decreases, as we go from 8,000 base pairs to 500 base pairs, the migration distance increases. Okay, and so if we were to graph these, like on this little graph paper here, um, which of these would be on the X axis and which would be on the Y axis? X would be the fragment size, base pair. Right, yeah, that's our independent variable, would be the fragment size, and then the migration distance that would be dependent. So how far the fragment travels depends on its size. Uh, professor, a question for it. When you was putting, um, you was explaining at the uh, table that we can do by eyes. So I know when we go to migration distance in milliliters, I know it's, it's a little formula that we need to change in milliliters, right? Um, so this, is showing us like, cause they have like this little printed ruler here and these numbers on the ruler indicate centimeters, mm -hmm. right? And there are 10 millimeters in a centimeter. So this line here, that would be 10, that would be one centimeter is actually 10 millimeters. So that's why like this last band here, the 500 base pairs, uh, it's a little bit past five centimeters but that would make it 50 something millimeters. So that's where I got those values from. So you, instead of putting centimeters, you put milliliters. Exactly, yeah, this is the distances in millimeters, even okay. though, yeah, these numbers are centimeters here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so like I said, we're not actually going to graph this, but if we were to graph it, uh, it would basically look something like this. So we would have, you know, obviously this indicates uh, the distance traveled in millimeters. And then the X axis is our fragment size. So smaller fragments are gonna travel a great deal. And then the larger fragments are not gonna travel as far. So you, and it's also a logarithmic skill that we're looking at. So basically it would look something like this.
Okay, so the smaller the fragment, the further it'll travel. Larger fragments do not travel as far. Professor, mm -hmm. I do have a question. Why did you get the six and the and the five five point five? Uh, so I honestly got those numbers from the like answer key that I have access to. Um, mm. These would be, so I, I don't feel like this is really to scale. I feel like you would need to take like your own like centimeter ruler and yeah. put it up against the paper, the screen yeah. to yeah. measure the distance from here uh, to the 8,000 base pair fragment and then so on and so on. Because like from here, I mean, this is quite a ways, but it almost looks like this 8,000 base pair mark is about the 10 millimeter mark. Um, I think the exact values for these distances is not as important as um, the relational value between the two variables. So whether this number here is six millimeters or 10 millimeters, as long as it's a small number compared to down here, like this should be the much bigger number. Um, so I don't, I don't think the exact numbers really matter. It's more about, do you understand the concept of larger fragment travels not as far as these smaller fragments? I have a question. As mm -hmm. far as like measuring, are we measuring vertically or horizontally? Uh, we're measuring vertically. So we're starting at the well and then measuring to each band. Professor, and how do we know which one is the smaller fragment or the larger fragment? That's not too clear to me. Um, so, we, so we're going to use our ladder since that's our standard. This is our size standard. So the ladder contains fragments of known sizes. And so these, um, these fragment size indications here. Uh, these are provided by like the manufacturer who like made this ladder standard. Mm -hmm. So these samples, we don't know anything about. These are from our experiments, but we know for a fact that this band here represents, you know, that fragment is 8,000 base pairs and the next fragment is 7,000 base pairs. So, so for use... instance, um, H is the one that is the largest? Right, yeah. So in this example, yeah, H is uh, pretty much in line with the 8,000 base pairs. So I would say this is at or very, very near 8,000 base pair fragment. Okay, thank you. Professor, I have a question mm -hmm. about um, part three of so I asked how many times does the, how are we supposed to figure that out? The third question. Yeah, yeah. So this um, has to do with, yeah, the number of cut sites and the number of fragments we get. Um, so let's do, let's see, did we, okay. So it says we're starting with linear DNA. That's good. That's important. We need to know that. So we know we're starting with a linear piece of DNA. And if we look at the, like key or the legend over here, it tells us that lane four, this band here was DNA only. So that means our uncut fragment, our you know, main piece of DNA without any restriction enzymes is 8,000 base pairs. So again, we can draw this out to make it easier to visualize. Um, oh yeah, I guess we'll just stick with this color. So let's say this is our, you know, double stranded, oops, a little bit wonky there. This is our double stranded DNA from H, right? So it hasn't been cut. It's just DNA only, no restriction enzymes, and it's 8,000 base pairs long. Oops, okay, so we'll put that there, 8,000 base pairs long. And now um, if we look at, let's say, lane one, where we had DNA plus the echo R1 um, enzyme, we ended up with two fragments. 
So if there's two fragments, how many times did echo R1 cut this DNA? One time. Just one. once, yeah. So let's, uh, I'm gonna, so since echo R1 is represented by this red color, I'm gonna use this red line to indicate, okay, so that was where the echo R1 cut this DNA. And so that's how we got fragment A and fragment B. So it looks like A is about 5,000 base pairs. Is that what we're supposed to write here? And B is about 3,000. So that makes sense, right? Because 5,000 plus 3,000 equals 8,000, which is like our total size. Now, if we look at the, the next enzyme, hind three, that also gave us two fragments. So how many cut sites are there if we ended up with two fragments? One. Just one, right. So we can use this blue. And we see that these fragments, uh, one of the pieces is about 7,000 base pairs long, and the other fragment was 1,000. So this cut pretty unevenly, probably closer to one end than the other. Oops. And now in uh, lane three, we have the DNA and both of these enzymes. So we end up with three fragments which kind of corresponds to what we have here in our little schematic that we've drawn. So we end up with a fragment at about 4,000, one at 2,000, and another at 1,000. Uh, so in lane three, uh, there is only two cuts, right? Exactly, yep. And I remember running into this problem um, in the last review session I did, or like the last time I did this exam two review, that these numbers don't all add up to 8,000 base pairs. And that's just a mistake in whoever created this review packet. So these numbers should add up to 8,000. So please don't be thrown by the fact that they don't. That's just, um, I think this F band should be a little higher up to um, correspond with the 3000 mark. So to answer the question, um, are we saying, are we answering it with like just the, the uh, eco RI and the whatever the other one by itself or the ones that they do together? Uh, that's a good question. I would just answer, since it doesn't say both of them together, it just says ECOR1 or HIND3. Um, I would say, you know, they each cut it once. So ECOR3 cuts the DNA once, and HIND3 cuts the DNA once. And okay, it asks for an explanation. Well, your explanation is um, because there are, are two fragments oops, in lane one, and we began with a linear piece of DNA. Professor, uh, I'm sorry again to ask this. I wanted to double check if I understand. Uh, now that you have these values here in each one of the, um, whatever it is, strand or ladder, 
uh, again, my question is how you pass through to milliliters, migrant decent milliliter, for example, C says 7,000. Right. Uh huh. So how many millimeters would that be? Seven. Um, mm -hmm. No, so I guess if we if we use this as our kind of metric. Oh, for well, that is what I need to use the ruler. Yeah, exactly. So this is about, it looks like 1.2. 1. 1. 1. So it'd be like 12 millimeters, maybe. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see, I see. That is what I need to use the ruler. Okay, I understand yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so for this other table on the next page, um, so it does want you to measure the, the distance in millimeters of all of your unknown bands. So we estimated the sizes of these bands based on like their relationship or like where they are in relation to our ladder bands. And that's one way to estimate the size. Another way is to, again, um, if this is like your zero point from your ruler, measuring just how far physically in millimeters each band traveled. Okay, and so if you measure the distance for each of these bands, how far it traveled in millimeters and record those distances here. So what did we say? C was about 11 or 12 millimeters. So if you had all those migration distances listed here, and then let's say you had a standard curve, well, you could find your migration distance on the y-axis, follow it over to where it lines up or where it intersects your standard curve line and come down vertically. And then that would be like the fragment size. So very similar to how we use that standard curve with the absorbance and the maltose concentration, same concept here. If you have one of the variables, you can extrapolate the other variable from your standard curve. Uh, and that's really like the whole basis for like making standard curves is if you know where one variable is, you can figure out uh, where the other variable is. And again, you do not need to make this graph on your exam, but you will be given a standard curve graph for this kind of data and you'll be expected to know how to use it. Uh, professor, um, my professor make us to do graphs. So um, for this, uh, that you, this line that you mentioned, uh, what is that we need to look for? Um, so for, if you were making the standard curve graph, mm -hmm. Um, so these would be your distances, and you'll notice that they're not spaced equally because it's a logarithmic scale. Mm -hmm. The distance here is not as far as the distance between these two numbers and these two numbers. So um, you would be using, you know, the migration distance here. And then um, along the bottom, you do have a regular interval of these spaces. And so you would just have to decide like how many boxes is going to equal like 500 base pairs or 1,000. So let's say, let's say each of these little boxes, we're gonna make equal to 100 base pairs. So we've got one, two, three, four, five. So this would be your 500 base pair mark. Seven, eight, nine, 10. This would be a thousand base pairs. Five, this would be 2000 base pairs. Five, seven, nine, 10, and so on. And so you'd make, your little marks like that, and then plot your points, right? So these would be your, your X and your Y points. So 8,006, that would be a point over here. 555.5, that point would be like here, thereabouts. And once you have all your points plotted, then you just connect them with um, a smooth kind of curved line. Also, sorry to go. Can I see quickly on the top? Just one minute. This one? No, on the on the, top. On the other page. Yeah, yeah, just just one. Okay.
Thank you, Professor. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, so if we're all clear on this one, we can move on to the next page. Uh, and now we're kind of returning to that sickle cell disease example from class and uh, we're trying to genotype the individuals of this family. Uh, and so this is basically giving us results of a restriction enzyme digest and gel electrophoresis from two additional families. And so we have to interpret these results. So the positioning of the bands and also how many fragments there are, how many bands there are, um, that's going to translate to um, their genotype. So we want to figure out the genotypes and phenotypes of all of the parents in family, or yeah, all of the members of each of these families. So first, let's try to remind ourselves. So we know that we know that the um, HBA, HB, the HBA allele, that's our normal allele, is going to be cut into two fragments, right? because it has that restriction site intact. So uh, do we remember the relative size of these fragments? I think I would have to- 150? Yeah, something like something that. Something like that, yeah. Um, I'm going to go back and just look at the my lab really, really quickly. I think it was 233 base pairs. I'm pretty sure. That's right. Yeah, yeah 233, 67 or something. Do, do we have to put the length or we don't um, need the length? Not necessarily, but... um. We don't need like the exact length, but ballpark is fine. So yeah, I think, yeah, you're right. It's like 233 and like 60 or something, 60 base pairs for the other one. But the important part is that the normal allele gets cut and we get two, two smaller fragments and the disease allele just remains as one fragment. So that's like really the, the main point there. So when we look at in family A, uh, member A, they have three fragments. So what does that mean about their genotype? It contains the mutant. Right, yeah, so they, so they have one intact fragment. Oh, my numbers are all off. Okay, so yeah, maybe it is like 250 and then we'll just say 200 and 50. Right, so they've got an intact fragment and then a cut fragment. So they're both carriers of the disease? Exactly, yeah. So it means that uh, individual A has one of each of these alleles, and so does individual B. So they're both heterozygote for this disease trait. And that means, yeah, it's a growth carriers. So say parent A, their genotype is HBA, HBS. They are heterozygous and a carrier. Parent B, same thing. They have uh, one disease allele and one normal allele. That makes them a carrier. And then individual C has um, two fragments. Individual D has two fragments. So what does that do? What does that mean for their genotype? Homozygous. Right. They're going to be homozygous um, for the HBA allele. 
So they, child C and child D are both um, HBA, HBA. So they are homozygous normal. Professor, just to be sure, um, if I notice that there's three fragments, what does that indicate again? If there's three fragments, it means they have both of these alleles. So they have one copy of each. Okay, the um, sickle cell, well, the disease and then the normal allele. Right. Okay. Yeah, so this top band is the HBS allele. And then these two fragments represent the HBA allele. So if they have three bands, it means they've got one of these and one of these. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then if we go to family B, so what is the genotype and phenotype of individual A? So they also have three fragments. So that means uh, they have the same genotype as over here. So they're gonna have one normal allele that got cut into two fragments, and then one of those um, sickle cell alleles. So they are also, this one parent is a carrier. Their partner though, individual B is not a carrier. They are homozygous normal as are the two children. So all three, uh, so B, C, and D of the second family are all homozygous uh, normal. Is it possible to determine like if um, a child or a parent is HBS from this? If, um, so if someone was homozygous for the HBS allele, so if they only had the HBS allele, that means they only had alleles that did not get cut, that means they would just have one band present at this location. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So that would be homozygous affecting? Yes. Yeah, if they just had, and it would be like a thicker band too, if there's like two of those HBS alleles, so it would be a thick band, just one band, then yeah, that would be HBS, HBS, and they would be homozygous uh, affected. Uh, in case, it's not the case here, but we have only one band means that uh, they had the disease, right? Exactly, yeah, they would have sickle cell disease. Yeah, let's see if I can um, scribble out. Yeah, so let's say, I'll kind of blank that out. So if it was HBS, HBS, it would, it would look like this. To be like a very just one very thick band right there um professor can you scroll up a bit so i can see part a
So if they were carriers of the disease, they would have four lines? Um, no, if they're carriers, they have the three lines. Because carriers mean they've got one normal allele, the normal allele gets cut by the restriction enzyme, and then the disease allele does not get cut. So it's like an intact fragment. Got it. So the genotype for uh, say for the one fragment, the DC, uh, what can be the genotype for that? Um, homozygous recessive? Um, it would be homozygous affected, the way that it's described up here. Yeah, it would be homozygous affected versus the homozygous normal. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, this uh, question B here, it's talking about these two parents from family B. So one of the parents is heterozygote, the other is homozygous normal. And it asks uh, us to calculate the chance that their children will be affected with sickle cell disease. So HBA, HBS, and then the other individual is just HBA, HBA. Um, so we can figure this out by drawing a Punnett square. Oh, I don't want to color it in. Okay. Okay, and then we can uh, put the parents' alleles. So one parent is AA and the other parent's AS. Okay. So we got an A and an S and then two A's. Okay, and then we can just sort of fill in these boxes based on all this information. Sorry, my A's look like fours. Okay, so this one's gonna be AA, this one's AA. Here we've got A and S, and the next one is also A and S. So uh, what is the chance that any of their children will have sickle cell disease? 50-50 chance. Now, careful with the wording, disease versus trait. Will any of their children- Zero. Zero. Yeah, exactly. So uh, the chance of sickle cell disease is zero, the chance of uh, sickle cell trait is 25 or 50%. So, uh, Professor, so if both parents were heterozygous, and then the chances would be definitely the kids would be affected, correct? Right. Yeah. If, if they were both heterozygous, like in this example, if they were both AS, AS, then there would be a 25% chance of sickle cell disease and a 50% chance of that sickle cell trait. Okay, thank you. Professor, mm -hmm. are we gonna have something in the exam like this that we analyze? Yes, yeah, there will be like something with this kind of banding pattern and you'll be asked to determine the genotype and phenotype. I don't remember if there is something like this of calculating uh, chance of disease trait, but I do know that there is like something that looks like this on the exam and you have to determine the genotype. Thank you. Can Professor, can you just quickly explain the numbers you have at the top? I think I missed that, the 250 base point. Um, base pair, but uh, yes, yeah, so this size. just refers to the size of these DNA fragments. So the, um, the HBS allele, uh, because it does not get cut, it's like the intact fragment, intact like PCR copy or whatever that we made. Um, and I think it's actually like 267 base pairs or something from the exercise. 
but I just kind of approximated that's like 250 base pairs, like that's approximately the position it's in compared to the ladder. And remember the special thing, the way that we were able to distinguish between this normal allele and the disease allele is that the normal allele has a restriction site. And so if you add a particular um, enzyme to it, it will cut the fragment into two pieces and the two pieces will be these approximate sizes. And that's what we see reflected here in our um, electrophoresis results. Okay, thank you. All right, these are excellent questions. I do want to keep it moving along, though. We still have a couple of pages left to uh, to cover. So a little bit on bacterial transformation and then mitosis. Um, and then once I'm like done covering the whole um, packet, then if you do have questions and you want me to go back to previous questions, uh, I'd be happy to do that at that time. So if we go to the next page, uh, it's just sort of like matching terms with their definitions. So for A, LB agar, uh, what number has a description of LB agar? Wouldn't it be? Two? Yeah, it'd be number two here. All right. So LB agar, those are our nutrients that we grow the bacteria on. Glycerol. That would be five. Five. Exactly. Yeah, it's a cryopreservative. It's a way to freeze things without destroying them. All right, C, ampicillin. C is um, six. Yes, yeah, it's an antibiotic. It kills bacteria. Then for D, the AMP R gene. 12. Right, so the AMP R gene, the gene codes for a protein, and that protein is that beta lactamase enzyme. All right, calcium chloride. Would that be three chemical oh, use? Three. Yes, exactly. That's what makes the cells competent. And in this context, by competent, we mean able to take up foreign DNA. F, beta lactamase. Uh, seven. Yes, it is an enzyme and it breaks down ampicillin. All right, next one is plasmid. Uh, one. One. Yes, who was trying to get my attention? Oh, I thought I heard someone say professor. Okay. Um, okay, let's move on to H, P glow. Nine. 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 Yeah, number nine, exactly. So P glow is the plasmid with the beta lactamase gene. Competence, I. Um, four. Yep. It would be number four, the ability to take up DNA from the surrounding environment. Transformation. Eight. Right. So if you, if a cell is competent and it is able to take up DNA, then we say it has been transformed. All right. Amp R E. coli. Ten. Ten. Exactly, yeah, it's able to grow in the presence of E. coli or um, ampicillin. And so by process of elimination, AMP S. E. coli is 11. Right, so it is sensitive. That's what the S means. So R stands for resistant, S stands for sensitive. Will this be on the exam? Um, not quite in this format, but I do believe there are some like multiple choice questions that ask you for, um, you know, like what is PGLO? And then there'll be a couple of choices to choose from. Mm -hmm. Or okay. like what was the gene that gave 
the bacteria antibiotic resistance. And so you'll have to know the name of the gene or like the product of the gene is that beta lactamase um, enzyme, that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, yeah, if you need a little refresher on the bacterial transformation, you can click on these links. Okay, so what was the link between p -glow, so that's the plasmid, and ampicillin resistance? So basically, how did this plasmid give cells ampicillin resistance? Um, the link between both is that uh, P -G P -glow, it contains an ampicillin gene for ampicillin resistance. So that successful transformants uh, can be distinguished uh, from cells that have um, that, that have not taken up plasmid DNA by their ability to, to grow on a medium uh, contained containing in that um, antibiotic. Right. That was a very um, eloquent, well-worded answer. I'm sorry, I can't. I wasn't able to get all of it down, but yeah, it was absolutely correct. So the pigloplasmid has a gene for an enzyme. Uh, that enzyme is the beta lactamase, and it confers ampicillin resistance because if um, an organism can make this enzyme, it can break down the ampicillin and basically the ampicillin is useless against it. So bacterial cells that are able to take up the plasmid uh, and, you know, become transformed uh, can grow in the presence of ampicillin uh, because they you know, make and secrete this enzyme. Uh, so how were you able to know that transformation had taken place? It glows under the UV light. Yeah, there was two features. So it was the growing in the ampicillin and also glowing, growing and glowing. Um, say the, the transformed bacterial cells load under UV light and grew in the presence of ampicillin. All right, what kind of controls did we use in that experiment? Yeah, so um, remind me what were on those two plates or what wasn't on them. E. coli without transformation, without the plasmid plus ampicillin was one of them. Yeah. So E. coli, I believe that was on plate B. So E. coli without plasmid, one on LB agar, ampicillin. And then we had E. coli grown on regular, just LB agar alone. I think maybe it was this way. Right, so we had two different plates where we had just the bacteria, no plasmid. And so each of these plates kind of served a purpose. They were both negative controls or like a type of negative control. Um, but what did they really tell us? So if we have E. coli, just regular E. coli, and we grow it on LB agar, what does that tell us? B uh, is the E. coli were not naturally resistant to the uh, ampicillin. Um, so you said plate B was, yeah, so it's just regular E. coli. So we know that it's not resistant to ampicillin and we were just growing it on regular agar. Yeah, and the uh, ampicillin 
uh, was not uh, effective at preventing the bacterial growth. Um, wouldn't that be what plate C showed that the ampicillin? The plate C, uh, I guess E. coli was uh, viable and could grow under the right conditions. Okay, well, maybe I forget which one is which, but okay, yeah. So plate B, um, yeah, if it's just the regular E. coli grown on LV agar, it shows us that, yeah, like our E. coli is viable, it's normal, it can grow under normal conditions. Um, viable and able to grow. So one of these controls showed us that the E. coli we're using are behaving the way that they're expected to behave. They're growing when you give them the right stuff. When we have the agar and ampicillin, well, the ampicillin should kill the E. coli, right? Yes. So that kind of shows us that our ampicillin is working. So one of these plates showed that the E. coli is working the way it's supposed to. And then the other control showed us that the ampicillin is working the way it's supposed to. Now, I don't remember uh, the exact plates, like which one had the ampicillin and which one did not. So these might be switched, but um, so if that's the case, you know, you just have to switch these answers around. B has the ampicillin. Okay, B has yes. the ampicillin. Okay, good. Right, so having the ampicillin and just regular E. coli show that yes, our ampicillin is effective and um, it does what it's supposed to do. So we know that the we can be uh, certain that the bacteria in plate A were transformed because they were able to grow in this normal ampicillin. And then plate C showed that yes, our E. coli was also normal and um, grew as expected under normal conditions. Plate C shows us that E. coli doesn't normally grow. A glow, sorry, glow. <laughs> oh, glow, yeah. Yeah, and exactly. It, um, yeah, the both control plates show that E. coli does not naturally have that ability to glow. So if they do glow, that means that they've been transformed. Um, uh, okay, another kind of iteration of one of the previous questions. So why do the bacteria survive if they accept that p glow plasmid? Well, they survive because of the plasmid that has the gene of ampicillin resistance. Right. Okay, I guess we can say they inherit <laughs> um, the, the gene for ampicillin resistance. That would be the beta lactamase gene. All right. Uh, I don't want to scroll too far down, but okay, I'll just scroll far enough that we can see what we're looking at with this question. Um, so what kind of growth would we expect on each of these plates? So on you want to pay attention to what is um, going on each plate. First plate, we have a colonies of bacteria. Col colonies of ampicillin resistance. Yes, yeah, the colonies of ampicillin resistant E. coli. So we know that they are resistant because they have that PGLO added. Yes. The other one would be no growth, I think. Yeah, ampicillin, which is regular E. coli, we get no growth. And then agar and E. coli. Would we get colonies of E. coli or a lawn of bacteria? A lawn, a oh, lawn of bacteria. Right. Oh, it looks like there's another option of lawn of ampicillin susceptible E. coli. 
I mean, I guess technically we could say that. I, I would say either answer is correct. Because yeah, since they have not been transformed, they are theoretically susceptible to ampicillin, but it's just gonna be total overgrowth. So what is the difference between those two options, the lawn versus the susceptible? Um, so I guess the, the other answer kind of implies that, what's well, saying ampicillin susceptible. So if we were to add, if we were to like grow this bacteria and then add ampicillin onto it, it would presumably um, suffer and die as a result. So we're assuming that these E. coli are susceptible because we didn't transform them with P. Uh, I think that's sort of tricky though. I don't know why that, cause like they're both answers are correct. So I don't know why they would put both of them there. Um, I would accept both as correct. Maybe other professors are a little bit pickier if they're picky, then you should go with the lawn of ampicillin susceptible E. coli. It's just one is more specific to what we're looking at in the experiment than the other one. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't realize I left my mic open, <laughs> but I, I understand that. I just thought, you know, both kind of have the same meaning in this context. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. So we are heading into the last um, bit of this review talking about mitosis. And um, really for this one, for the exam, you're gonna want to know like how to identify um, the different like phases of mitosis by looking at an image of cells. So there will be like stations where there's like pictures of cells. And so you'll have to say like, you know, maybe what's phase they're in and also like what's happening to the chromosomes um, in that phase. So you wanna be familiar with like what the phase looks like and what the events are in that phase. Um, and you know, like that's stuff that should, you should be covering in lecture too. So um, hopefully you have a pretty good background for that. So for the stages, we can say that we have G1, gap one. Yep. Then we have synthesis, then G2 and metaphase. Uh, you mean mitosis? Mitosis, yes. Yeah, we've got G1, S, and then G2, and then the M or mitosis phase. Should so what happens? Or it's just mitosis. I'm sorry? A M shouldn't be a me metaphase. Um, when you're talking about the cell cycle, it's uh, the M stands for mitosis. If you're talking about the phases of mitosis, then M stands for metaphase. Oh, metaphase, yeah. So what's happening in the G1 very generally? Replication, replication of DNA? No, that does not happen in G1. Um, division of the nucleus? Cell growth. Cell growth. Cell growth. Yeah, cell growth. Is, yeah, just growth of the cell. All oh, right. And yeah, it's just getting bigger, maybe um, making some more mitochondria or some other like organelles. The S phase, what happens in the S phase? In the CNA replication. Yes, exactly. So the S think synthesis and think DNA replication. So that's very specific to that phase, right? And, and then let's do the G2. So after DNA replication, we go into G2. What happens in the G2 phase? Uh, cell growth and DNA repair. Yeah, more cell growth. Could be some DNA repair, uh, replicating organelles, getting ready for the cell division. Uh, professor, would cell division also happen in the M phase? Yes, yeah, that's what happens in M is our cell division. So M is, in this case, mitosis, and that is our cell division. Uh, what's the difference between mitosis and cytokinesis? Really, what are we separating in these two? Mitosis is the separation of the nucleus, and cytokinesis is the physical partition of the cytoplasm. Right, so mitosis, we are separating our replicated uh, genetic material. 
And then cytokinesis, we are separating the actual cytoplasm, like all the stuff in the cell. Well, there's like, can we also say in cytokinesis that um, it's um, a division of the cytoplasma? Mm -hmm. like the cytoplasma. And can and we here. also say uh, that one is a division of the nucleus and the other one is a division of the um, cytoplasm? Yes, absolutely. That, um, yeah, saying it's separation or, um, yeah, division of nucleus or genetic material, different ways to say the same thing. But yes, that would also make sense. Okay, so how is cytokinesis different in our plant and animal cells? Animal cells form a cleavage world and a plant cells form a cell plate. Right. Yeah, so in animal cells have that cleavage furrow, that kind of pinching in. And then um, plant cells, because they have that rigid cell wall, they form a cell plate. And oops, I just answered the next question. Plant cells have a rigid cell wall. Just a quick question. So in the um, plant cells, do they, do the two cells ever pinch off? I mean, not in terms of the cleavage furrow, but is that new cell plate just taking the original cell wall and splitting it in two basically? And so they share, they now share a border? Um, no, it's, um, the cell plate is just kind of the like initial boundary. And I think um, once that cytoplasm is sort of halved, then they kind of build up their, you know, cell wall. So they have like their own separate cell walls. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Thanks. Um, so for this next question, when we talks about like what's going on in each phase. Um, so here where it says the physical state of chromosomes, what it means by that is uh, you want to be clear on, you know, in which phase do we have replicated or unreplicated chromosomes? So replicated versus unreplicated. Um, and oh, whether the sister chromatids are still attached or are they pulled apart? So if you keep that like kind of language in mind, um, it'll be easier to like answer these questions. So now we're talking about the phases of mitosis. So prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Do you mean the PMAT? The PMAT, exactly. So in prophase, uh, what's going on with our chromosomes? Are they replicated or unreplicated? Are they attached? Are they apart? They're replicating. Yes, chromosomes are, they've already replicated. Um, they're condensed, right? They're like condensed down because the nucleus is falling apart. They're getting ready to, um, to align in the middle for metaphase. Um, and our Sister chromatids are attached. All right, in metaphase, what can we say about the state of the chromosomes? Uh, what's the number of chromosomes in the prophase? Please? 20, um, well, no, it's 46. Yeah, like let's, we can focus on the, the number for in part B of the question. Because it, it kind of asks us that it gives us like a number for like the human cells. So um, for, for part A, let's just focus on like the physical state of the chromosomes. So in metaphase, are the chromosomes still replicated? 
Yes. Yes, they are. Um, are the chromatids still attached to each other? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to continue it over here. So for oops, anaphase. So what's going on with anaphase? Our sister chromatids are being pulled apart. Right. So the chromatids are now pulled apart. And so now each of these individual chromatids they have been pulled from their replicant. So now we can say that they're unreplicated because you know, they were replicated and kind of together with their twin and now they're pulled apart. So we, call, we say that they're unreplicated. And then for telophase, Chromosomes are already divided? No. So the chromatids, uh, they're still unreplicated and now they are, they're kind of starting to be formed into these two new nuclei. So they're apart and unreplicated, unreplicated in new nuclei. In a new what? Uh, nucleus. Well, nuclei is the plural of nucleus. So I'm saying they're in two nuclei. They're each in their own nucleus now. In, in, in new nuclei. Mm So for part B of this question, where now it's bringing in the numbers of chromosomes and it's using the human cell as an example. So if in G1, we have 46 chromosomes, unreplicated, uh, how many chromosomes will we have at G2? So after S phase, how many chromosomes do we have? 22. 92. We've got 92 pieces of DNA, or you could say 46 replicated chromosomes, right? Because they haven't been pulled apart yet. They've just sort of like grown a little identical twin next to it. So you could say 46 replicated, 92 total. And as we enter prophase, that's not going to change. So in, in prophase, we're going to continue on with that. We're going to have 46 replicated chromosomes, just like we talked about up here. Our chromatids are attached. And that would be the stem in uh, metaphase, right? Exactly. Yeah, 46. They're still replicated, still attached. So now in anaphase, now when we've pulled them apart, first of all, we're going to say that they're unreplicated because we've uh, unattached the, chromos the uh, chromatids. So that would be uh, 92. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Thanks. And then in telophase, think about in each of that of those two new nuclei we're creating. 46 unreplicated. 46 and 46. In a new nucleus, yep. 
and I'll say like times two because we have two new cells now. Okay, I'm going to scroll down just a little bit so we can see the next two questions. Um, so why did we look at the onion root tip and the whitefish blastula? Because onion roots is actively, actively uh, dividing. Mm -hmm. okay, well, that's a simple way to say it can be as well. Um, I, I, I put this because there is a lot of mitosis over there. Yeah, that's the thing that I put. And uh, yeah, and the cells are in, yeah, they're, they're in active mitosis. They're in various stages of mitosis. Yeah, exactly. Very simple answer. Don't need, need any more detail than that. Um, so genetically, the, the two daughter cells that re result from mitosis, genetically, what do those daughter cells look like? Are they identical or are they different? Those other cells identical. are the parental cells. Exactly. Yeah, the daughter cells, they're identical to each other and to the parent cell. Uh, from which they derived. All right, and what is the point of mitosis? So in a multicellular organism like ourselves, um, why is mitosis useful? And it replaces like dead cells, old cells. Yeah, replaces uh, injured or dead tissue or dead cells. Allows the organism to grow larger. Right, yeah, allows for growth. Uh, also development. Yeah, that's pretty much it. So being able to replace old worn out dead cells or, um, you know, being able to uh, recover from illness or injury sometimes in, in, in requires new cell growth. And then just the act of growing, just getting bigger and developing different tissues over time. Okay, I'm, I'm not trying to rush anyone, but um, I mean, we are getting a little bit closer to that time. And I, I know I'm feeling a little fatigued from this. I'm sure you all are too. I'm exhausted. All the brain power, yeah. So um, yeah, let's try to just power through this last page. Yeah, there's literally just one page left and it's just identifying the different mitosis phases. And um, please, if you like come across questions, like as you continue studying and you want to reach out and ask me, um, feel free to email me. I'll put my email in the chat box again, just hs at montgomerycollege.edu. All right. So if we look at um, starting with the onion. Sorry. Yeah. Could you see this page quickly down there? So it's like this one. Illness. Yeah, I got it. Thank okay. you. Illness. Okay. Thank you. I'm done, Professor. Okay. Thank you. Yes. All right. So we've got different stages of mitosis indicated by these red arrows. Um, yes. Some stages are going to be a little bit easier to identify than others. So for instance, um, the stage that looks like two hands kind of coming apart or coming together, what stage is this? Anaphase. Anaphase. 
Exactly. That's going to be anaphase. We are pulling our chromatids apart. It's very visually quite dramatic to see. Um, what about something like this, where it just looks like speckles inside of the cell? Prophase. Right. Prophase. This would be prophase. So this is when the um, chromosomes are condensing down and they're just starting to become visible. Um, so this would be another example of prophase where you can actually start to see the individual chromosomes. They're not quite in position yet for like in the midline, but they're getting there. Um, let's see what what's being shown here where they're kind of lined up. Metaphase. Metaphase. Yes. Metaphase, also another, um, it, it's a pretty distinct cell phase, right? Because they're all kind of in the center. Although depending on how you view the cell, it could look like a line or it could look like something like this. So depending on if you have like a top-down view or if you're looking at it from the side, um, that's what these distinctions here mean, metaphase polar view or metaphase lateral view. If it just looks like a line and they're all lined up in the center, that's the lateral view. Um, if it kind of looks like you're looking into a tube of like pencils and they're all sticking up at you, that would be the polar view. Now here's another good one of that lateral view. Uh, what about here, where it looks like we've got like two little cells next to each other? Telophase. Mm -hmm. Right. So telophase, and I would even put in cytokinesis because you can, if you zoom in really close, you can really, you can see like the beginning of that cell plate there. It's like a very faint line dividing these two small looking cells. There's another one up here. Uh, what else? What about uh, this cell here? It doesn't really look like it's doing much of anything. Interface. Um, interface. Exactly. Yeah, interface uh, does not look like anything. So you really can't see the chromosomes at all. There's nothing um, of distinction happening. All right. Uh, what would we say about this one here? From metaphys? Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like the in between. So the chromosomes are obviously condensed, but they're not really lined up in any kind of specific orientation. So that would be an in between one. Mm. Uh, what about this one over here? Prometaphase? I, yeah, this one's tricky. I would say it's either prometaphase. Yeah, because it's not quite anaphase. Anaphase looks very organized. So it's still pretty messy, I would say, prometaphase. Um, the pictures that you'll see on your exam are not going to be ambiguous at all. It'll be very clear, like, which of the four phases you're looking at. And um, I don't think they include prometaphase on your exam. It's only going to be like the PMAT phases, like those four main ones. They will only include PMAT then. You're right. Yeah, just the PMAT. Um, all right, let's look at the whitefish blastula. These can be a little bit trickier because uh, the features are just more faint, so they can be harder to kind of distinguish. Uh, so let's start with this cell here. Metaphase. Metaphase. Mm -hmm. Metaphase, yeah, and that's going to be a lateral view because we see everything's just kind of like lined up on that metaphase plate. Uh, what about this one here? Prometaphase. Prometaphase. So this one, it could be prometaphase or it could be the polar view of metaphase. So I think either of those answers would be appropriate. So if you're like looking down at the top of the cell with all the chromosomes aligned in the middle, it kind of looks like a little like, it kind of radiates out like a star. All right, Andrea, I can uh, scroll up a little bit. I still wanna be able to see a little bit of the bottom picture. All right, what about this guy over here on the left? Anaphase. 
Uh, yeah. Very clear anaphase there. Uh, what about this cell that looks empty? Prophase? Interface. Interface. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So if you, if you can't even see the individual like chromosomes condensed down, it's interface. So only when you start seeing like the dark bits in there is it uh, prophase. See, we got a lot of anaphase, anaphase, anaphase. Um, how about the second in the top? Uh, the, this one? That one, yeah. Yeah, so here we are starting to see some chromosomes condensed down. Prophase. Uh, yeah, that would be a prophase, exactly. Uh, it looks like most of these are metaphase, right? It kind of looks like our anaphase. Uh, what about this yeah, one here? Telophase. That's telophase. Yeah, definitely. Telophase and cytokinesis. We see that cleavage furrow and that little cell membrane starting to form. Exactly. All right. Uh, yeah, so pretty self-explanatory, these pictures, and uh, there's lots of examples you can find online, too, if you feel like you need a little more practice with identifying uh, these different phases. Uh, but the, the questions or like the pictures that you see on your exam, they'll be um, very clear, like which of the PMAT phases uh, you're in. Professor, are we going to have to look at them um, under a microscope or is it just going to be a picture on the paper? Uh, no microscope. It's going to be a, like a printed out picture. Oh, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, so that is the end of the review packet. So um, I want to thank you all so much for your participation and your attention. You all have been wonderful. I love the questions. Really great interaction. It made it more interesting, more fun for me. Um, so like I said, I'm going to be converting this into a, a YouTube video. It takes a couple awesome. to um, upload the file. But then once I have the link, I can send it out. So if you email me and ask me for that link, I can reply to your email with it. Thank you so awesome. much. Yes, sir. So could you show me the two part? Very quick, I won't waste your time. It's for the bacterial transformation matches. I just want to see. Oh, the, the matching of the terms? Yeah. I think okay. I make one mistake by 